So boom. There we go. My speaker was off. All right, excellent. Well, today is Thursday, April 29th. We have uh, some business to take care of. Uh, we need to finish our cranial nerves today. We'll start with that right off the bat. Uh, then we will finish our discussion of the spinal cord, which will end our discussion of the central nervous system. And from there, we will talk about the autonomic nervous system. Uh, for the rest of today, uh, all of, uh, of uh, Tuesday, and then uh, we'll see how much we get into the sensory stuff on the 6th. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, you still have two more assignments. Uh, you have your unit review 14 that is due Tuesday next week and that reflex lab. Again, uh, I want you to try all the activities that you are able to try. Anything you're not able to try, uh, uh, do as a thought experiment. Try to figure out what you think the correct answers would be and why. And then after that, it's all tests all the time. Tuesday the 11th, your last lab and lecture exam. Uh, and then Tuesday, the 18th, you will have your cumulative final exam, which will be 100 multiple choice questions, uh, counts as a grade on its own, and as we said, have been able to uh, replace your lowest lecture score. And then, yes, uh, on Wednesday, the 19th, you finally get an opportunity to sleep. All right. Questions on any of that? All righty. In that case, then, let's move that over there. Let's pick up where we left off. And that was on our cranial nerves. We were working our way down the magical mystical journey of the cranial nerves. And as I mentioned at the end of the last class, we only had one more to get halfway through our list. But that last one is cranial nerve five. What is the name of cr cranial nerve five? The trigeminal. Trigeminal, excellent. Trigeminal nerve, excellent. And what does tri refer to? Three. But this is the fifth cranial nerve. So why is the fifth cranial nerve called trigeminal? There's three of them. Well, there's three branches of it. You've got absolutely the right idea. This picture does a nice job of showing it, but let's go ahead and talk about it uh, by writing it out. Basically, the fifth cranial nerve is our largest cranial nerve. Which one was the smallest again? Was it the optic? No, nope, optic wasn't the smallest. What was our smallest cranial nerve? Abducens. Yeah, six abducens, absolutely. Uh, and it was below the pons. Five is special in a couple ways. It's the only one that comes actually off of the pons. Pons is usually a pretty large structure that's pretty easy to find and identify. Uh, so it's easy to distinguish it that way. It then comes almost immediately to a ganglion, which of course, as we know, is a cluster of cell bodies. And from there, it actually branches into three distinct branches. Branch one, we'll put branch two down there, and branch three here. These three branches are significant enough that they actually have their own names. And anybody know the names of these three branches? Well, what's the superior most branch? If only there was a way to figure these types of things out. The superior something. Not a bad guess, because it is the one on top, absolutely. But in this case, it's the ophthalmic. The ophthalmic branch. With a name like ophthalmic, where do you think it goes? To the eye. Towards the eye, absolutely. Although we've already seen a lot of stuff involving with the eye. So we've got that ophthalmic branch. The middle branch, I'll give you the other way around, goes to your upper jaw. There you go. So it is the maxillary branch. And the third branch goes to your lower jaw. So it would be the 
There we go. Mandibular. Oops. Excellent. So when we are talking about the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five, oops, that's not a five, that's five. Trigeminal, it's got those three branches uh, and those three branches all have distinct names. Now, what is the functional type for our largest cranial nerve? Well, how many possible Mo answers do you have? Is it motor? Okay, so uh, motor is one of the mm -hmm. answers. What are the other ones? It's both sensory and motor. Yeah, being the largest, not surprisingly, it is going to be a mixed nerve. It is going to have both, uh, both motor and sensory in the trigeminal nerve. However, the three branches, let's talk about the three branches. Our ophthalmic branch, as you uh, clearly pointed out, heads towards the eye. As it heads towards the orbit of the eye, we just spent the last class talking about not one, not two, but three cranial nerves that are involved with moving pretty much any muscle you could think about associated with the eye. So do you think there's any more motor associated with the eye that we can do there? No. No. So as it turns out, the ophthalmic branch is sensory only. When we think of the type of sensory information it provides for us, basically it is from the orbit of the eye up. So again, it doesn't help us see, it doesn't help us move our eye through space, but if I poke you in the eye, are you gonna be aware of it? Absolutely, so sensory information uh, from the uh, nose, from the eye, from the forehead, and from the scalp, basically from here up. All this stuff from here up, it is providing that sensory information for. All right. Our maxillary branch, as we just finished talking about, uh, heads towards the upper lip, I mean the upper jaw. Can somebody move their upper jaw for me? demonstrate the movement of their upper jaw on camera? Anyone able to move their upper jaw and willing to demonstrate it for us? No. Only if it counts as extra credit. Sure, if you can move your upper jaw, I will give you extra credit for it. There you go, exactly. It's not possible, we can't move our upper jaw. So not surprisingly, the maxillary branch is sensory only as well. It provides sensory information uh, from, let's get some more space here, uh, from uh, the nasal cavity, uh, from the palate, the roof of your mouth, uh, from the upper jaw, upper lip, and the upper teeth. This is the one that uh, dentist tries to uh, block if they're gonna give you that root canal. Excellent. Now let's talk about the mandibular branch. Ophthalmic is sensory, maxillary is sensory. Do you think there's gonna be sensory in your mandibular branch? Absolutely. That one will be motor. Well, it's gonna be both. You're absolutely right. It's gonna be sensory, but as we know, the one thing that's special about our mandible is we can move it. So our mandibular branch is both sensory and motor, and it is this small motor component uh, to, our, um, uh, to our mandibular branch that makes the trigeminal nerve a mixed nerve. So it's only this one branch and this one bit, right? Uh, let's be consistent, the mandibular branch heads 
towards the lower jaw. And so not surprisingly, when we think of it from a sensory standpoint, uh, it is gonna provide sensory information uh, for uh, tactile from the tongue. Uh, from the lower jaw, lower, uh, lower lip, and the lower teeth. But you are absolutely correct. It has a motor function as well. And that motor function is basically to control muscles that move the jaw. Uh, for instance, like the ones we've talked about, the masseter and the temporalis. So there are a couple others as well, but those are two that we've talked about, and that is the motor control for that. So that one little bit of motor, the ability to move your jaw is what makes your trigeminal nerve a mixed nerve. It's mostly sensory, but all it takes is a little bit of motor to be a mixed nerve, and that's what we have here. Now, we do have one more issue. All of these things are going to different locations. One's going towards the eye, one's going towards the upper jaw, one's going towards the lower jaw. So notice each branch is going to have its own skull exit. So we need a nice, easy skull exit. Let's start easy, ophthalmic branch. If only we had learned about a nice big gaping hole that many nerves and blood vessels could pass through to get towards the orbit of the eye, where might something like that be? The superior orbital fissure. Absolutely, the superior orbital fissure, which was a bone feature of which bone again? The sphenoid. Excellent, perfect, perfect. So let's cheat and look at a skull. So as we know, the superior orbital fissure is right here. So we need some type of opening uh, that would maybe project uh, nearby, that would project towards the upper jaw and one that might project down towards the lower jaw. Do those types of things exist here as we look at this? What might a good bone feature that we've already learned in the class that projects anteriorly in the skull and has this nice big round opening to it that might be a useful skull exit to go to the upper jaw? The foramen rotundum. Excellent. And since we're going right in line, there might also be a quite conveniently located kind of oval shaped opening projecting downward, which would be somewhat convenient for getting to the lower jaw. And what might that be? I think it's the foramen ovale. Yeah, foramen ovale. Excellent. So there you go, those three skull exits, those three bone features, all of the sphenoid bone are gonna be the skull exits for the three branches. So if we go back to finish off our list here, our skull exit is the foramen rotundum of the sphenoid. And here, the skull exit is the foramen ovale of the sphenoid. And if we cheat and go back to our previous picture, lo and behold, here's our sphenoid. And here you see those three openings the uh, superior orbital fissure for the ophthalmic branch. Here is that foramen rotundum for the upper jaw branch. 
and the foramen ovale to go down to the tongue and to the mandible. So again, notice trigeminal is the only one that comes off the pons. It's the largest, so it's one of the easiest ones to find. But notice when it's cut like that, you don't see the big ganglion. You don't see the three branches. As I mentioned, your book's got some great pictures for these things. If you notice, if we switch slides here, we actually see this great illustration kind of showing you the regions that are innervated by the three branches. Uh, they sometimes use the terms V1, V2, and V3, right? Because it's cranial nerve five. A V, uh, but you will use the appropriate anatomical terms, ophthalmic, uh, maxillary, and mandibular. Uh, if you use V1, V2, and 3, I will only give you partial credit for that. So do not do that. Use the appropriate terms. But here it shows the sensory function. And then, as we mentioned, for that mandibular branch, uh, it also controls muscles like the masseter and the temporalis and a couple others you didn't have to learn that basically move the mandible through space. All right. So you can see why we didn't do that one at the end of time, even though it would have been nice to get halfway through our list. But this one takes a little bit more lifting to get to the end point. But we are here. We have identified the uh, not just the cranial nerve, but the individual branches, the functions of the individual branches, the skull exits of the individual branches, and the functional type for both the trigeminal and for the individual branches as more as well. And definitely you need to know all of that information. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Well, so we've made the top of the mountain. Let's work our way back down. We've hit the top, let's move on to number seven. Remember, we've already done six. Six is the abducens. As we mentioned, it is the smallest of our cranial nerves. So that means we are on to seven. What is the name of seven? The facial nerve. Facial nerve, and with a name like that, what do you think it does? Innervates parts of the face. Yeah, basically it controls the movements of the skeletal muscle of the face. As you can see here uh, from this elaborate illustration, right? As we talked about, we are incredibly um, proficient at nonverbal communication, right? By changing the look of our face, a squinting of the eyes and raising of an eyebrow, a smiling or pouting of the lips, we have the ability to express a tremendous amount of information and emotions just by the movement of the skin and the muscles of our face. And that is what our facial nerve does. Our facial nerve gives us that information or that ability to provide that information by providing that movement of these muscles of the skin. Very important in and of itself, but it does have, do I have it here? Nope, I don't. Oh yeah, I do. Uh, it does have a second function as well. There is some uh, parasympathetic functions we will talk about when we get to the autonomic nervous system. For instance, it is the pathway to our uh, lacrimal glands for crying. It is part of the pathway to the nasal cavity to produce mucus and things along those lines. But what I wanna talk about for now is that it has both sensory. This is of course a mixed nerve containing both sensory and motor. The motor is the movement of the face. The primary function of the sensory is to provide our sense of taste from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Now let's cheat and put that down here. So it provides that taste sensation from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Any idea why it's just the anterior two thirds? That color doesn't show up. The anterior two thirds and not the very back of the tongue. Is it because that's where the branches end? That's a, not a bad guess and that is accurate and true. Uh, I don't have a picture of one here. Uh, here, let's cheat, hold on a second. Give me one moment. Um, 
I'm going to guess digestive chart is the place to go. Ooh, I want this picture. Oh, they didn't show it. No, never mind. Let me look at this one. Your book's got some nice illustrations and things like that, but this is an excellent one from one of the charts that is in the classroom. Here we see a transverse section through the center of the head, through the oral cavity, and we can see the tongue. And notice as we look at the anatomy of the tongue, uh, there are these big, huge papillae called the circumvallate papillae. They contain a large number of taste bud receptors in them. And then there's all this tissue back here towards the back. The posterior, no, that's not what I wanted, I wanted that. The posterior third of the tongue doesn't look like the rest of the tongue. It is actually covered instead by a bunch of lymphatic tissue, some lymphatic nodules. They are your, what we call lingual tonsils. Those tonsils are part of your body's defenses playing a role and help to protect you from any harmful pathogens that may come in from the food and the water that you ingest. And so they don't play a role in really producing speech. They don't produce, play a role in taste. They don't play a role in uh, chewing or mastication or anything like that. They're really there for defense. They're on the you know, root of the tongue, so they don't move around too much, but they are there for protection. So it is only here on the anterior two thirds of the tongue where we get our sense of taste. And of course, how many taste sensations do we have? Many more than the typical four. Well, okay, first of all, you said four. What are those typical four you were talking about? Bitter, sour, salty, sweet. Bitter. Sour, salty, sweet. And yes, I would say that it's definitely more than the four. In fact, I would say it is about 25% more than four. So how many taste sensations do you actually have? Five. Five, there you go. Someone can do math, excellent. What's missing from our list? There you go, Ice? savory. Savory, absolutely, it is savory, is it? Of course, the savory was first described by some Japanese researchers. So they use instead of savory, which is essentially what it is, uh, they use the term umami. Umami. There you go, that umami sense. Uh, is that sensory, say, it's the kind of sensation you get from the juices of red meat or uh, from a cooked portobello mushroom, uh, that kind of stuff as well. So there are five main taste sensations. Yes, as someone mentioned, we can perceive thousands of different, or we can discriminate thousands of different tastes uh, from uh, this, but it's this combination of these five types of receptors that give us the, you know, when you're drinking your wine, allow you to, you know, taste the subtle hints of nectarine and oak or whatever kind of BS they say when you're doing that wine tasting stuff. Absolutely. Now, of course, anybody who has ever been in uh, one of those, uh, you know, kindergarten classrooms, you've seen they've got these great illustrations on the wall where the salty is right here in the front. And then below that is where the sweet is and then bitters over here on along the side and sours in the middle or whatever it is, right? Anybody ever seen one of these tongue taste maps before? Yes. Is that what it looks like? Does everybody have the exact same map on their tongue? No. 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 Well, they must, because if I go to Williams-Sonoma, I can spend $35 for a single Riedel wine glass, right? And the advantage of that $35 wine glass is not only that it has the right shape bulb on it so that when I just put my Cabernet in it, I can swirl it and it gets the right amount of air on it. But the lip of it is also formed in a way that when you present the wine to your mouth, it actually presents the wine to the taste regions of your tongue in the correct order to maximize your enjoyment of the wine. 
Now they wouldn't sell a $35 wine glass like that if it didn't really work, would they? Of course they would. I think they would. They they would. would. <laughs> Absolutely. It is total and complete BS. Absolutely. Do not buy those Rita glasses at Williams Sonoma. There is not a bigger fraud out there. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have a taste map. In fact, one of the activities you can do over this weekend, especially if you have kids, because it's a tremendous amount of fun, is you can do uh, your own taste maps. Basically, what you do is take a glass of water, rinse out your mouth, take a paper towel, and dry off your tongue. Once you do that, you take a Q-tip and dip it in some sugar water. And what you do is you rub that, sh that uh, let's, let's do it this way. You rub that tooth, uh, that not toothpick, you rub that Q-tip back and forth along the surface of your tongue. And what you'll notice is that you will only taste the sweetness in specific locations. Rinse out your mouth, uh, dry it out again, and do the same thing with salty water and you'll find that you have specific regions that can perceive salty. And then you can do the same thing with coffee and you'll find areas that have some bitterness to it and so, so on and so forth, right? You can do sour with the lemon. Uh, if you have MSG in your house, you can use that if you're sensitive to it. Then like I said, the juices from a cooked mushroom or juices from a cooked uh, meat, you can do the same thing and you'll get a taste map but your taste map and anybody else's taste map in the house are going to be different from each other. You're not gonna all have precisely the same taste map, but we do have taste maps. Now I did hear when someone mentioned uh, the taste sensation, someone said spicy. Why isn't spicy one of our taste sensations? Isn't it just more of a chemical reaction? That's part of it, absolutely. But you gotta also remember these taste sensations, which takes place in structures called taste buds, are chemoreceptors. As we know, the way a chemoreceptor works is a chemical key sits into a lock, and if it can turn the lock, it turns it on, and you get that sensation, right? You may not have thought of it in these terms, but you're well, well aware of it because companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi spend billions of dollars each year trying to find different types of artificial sweeteners that can give you that sensation of sweet to their drink without there actually being any carbs in it so that you can be all beautiful and skinny and healthy, right? From just from drinking a Diet Coke. Right. So those artificial sweeteners, their job is to, you know, find that chemical that turns that key and makes you believe that it's sweet, even when it isn't. Well, spicy, uh, which is primarily the chemical capsaicin. Capsaicin is a chemical found in like the hot peppers and things along those lines is like the janitor's key. And what is a janitor's key open? Everything, it's like Everything. a master. Exactly, so with capsaicin, what ends up happening is three things. First, it uh, stimulates all of our taste receptors. Uh, so we get a massive confusing signal sent to our brain. And that's basically what spicy is. But it also stimulates our pain receptors, right? And there you go. It also stimulates our temperature receptors. So you actually get that sensation of heat in your mouth. So when you eat really hot, spicy food, you're tricking your body into thinking that it is hot and it is warm and you get those sweats from eating the, the, the spicy food, right? You get the pain sensation from it. Everything gets red from the flushing of trying to release that heat uh, energy, right? And you get that overwhelming signal. So that's what that spiciness is. That spiciness is that janitor's key basically turning all the locks on your tongue and in your oral cavity, uh, and then you get to enjoy it again as it leaves the sensitive anus as well. Uh, so again, that capsaicin uh, gets to be enjoyed twice. All right. So I, I have a question. Sorry. No, no. So just... how are how are some people more like better at eating spicy food than others? Is that just their receptors are more sensitive or? 
So it's actually the opposite. So it's so it's twofold. Uh, the same way that um, well, so part of it is preference. Some people have preferences the same way. Some people like more salty things or more sugary things or more sweet things. There are some people who do like uh, more spicy foods and can have it. However, what happens is typically the more spicy foods you eat, uh, typically the more uh, desensitized your taste receptors become. So your taste receptors okay. typically uh, habituate and start firing less. So you get less stimulation from it. So you can kind of build up an intolerance. The problem with that is you typically become less sensitive to other tastes as well. So your taste sensations typically become less subtle as a result of them. Our taste buds only last about three to four days though. So again, if you are uh, doing a really, really spicy diet and then you take a week off from that, you will notice that there's a tremendous increase in your sensitivities to taste after that, after that recovery from that. Okay, thank you. Uh, cool. Uh, yes, Arthur, you had a question. Yeah, if it's just like chemicals that are sending signals to your brain, how does it really affect like I heard like people that eat a lot of spicy foods, like later on, they'll get like holes in their stomach or something like that. Or is that my mom just trying to BS me? Um, so what I would say to that is that capsaicin uh, does have, uh, because of the pain sensation that it produces and because it can act as an irritant, uh, it is, there is a potential to cause an increase in uh, the acidity of the stomach as a result of that. And that increased acidity of the stomach can over time, uh, you know, uh, um, potentially cause damage to the lining of the stomach in the same way that chronic stress. You know, if you have a really stressful job, you hear about people who have really stressful jobs, end up getting ulcers and things along those lines. The stress response uh, basically is similar to that pain response, increasing acid production and can cause problems that way. Uh, I don't know why you cough when it's spicy. I don't have a, I don't have a, uh, I don't have an answer for you on that one. Uh, and yes, so there, uh, that I have heard of those fruits that turn the sour into sweet. Uh, they were uh, they were a hot item you could buy on the interwebs a, uh, a year or two ago. I'm not sure if or buy the plants and buy the fruits and all of those. Uh, again, these are chemoreceptors. So as we know, we can block or modify our chemoreceptors so that it changes our perception. So yeah, so that's what happens with those. So yeah, you eat a lemon and suddenly it tastes sweet. Yep, I uh, I have. Heard of those, but I have not actually had a chance to try one of those. But we uh, we were looking for one of those before. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, Rick's uh, Rick's neat that way. Yes, Arthur. Yeah. Um, also, does this have a lot to do with like Gatorade and like um, like when you're not working out, like it tastes salty, and when you work out, it it tastes sweet. Um. Or it tastes good. <laughs> Great question. Um. Your state of hydration, I guess, potentially could. So definitely if your mouth is dry uh, versus more wet, that may be something that could potentially change your taste uh, perception that way. Uh, temperature, uh, so if it's cold versus something that's warm, that's definitely something that can affect the taste sensation as well. So those kind of things could possibly be an effect there. Or it may just be, it, you know, it may just be a cognitive thing when you're more working out, when you're feeling fatigued and tired, uh, it may be a more desirable, you know, flavor or sensation in that case. Uh, yeah, I think it's cognitive because it yeah. gator tastes totally different before workout and after. And after. All right, there you go. Excellent. All right. So that is almost everything we need to know about cranial nerve seven. Obviously, it, its functional type is both mixed. Uh, we've talked about the sensory and the motor function, but I want to go back to this picture because I think this picture does a really nice job of showing this. Notice here on our temporal bone, as we learned in the past, there is a big round bump behind the ear. And what was that big round bump behind the ear again called? Mastoid process. Mastoid process. And the long quill-like process that sticks out, what was that again? The styloid process. There you go, excellent. 
And if you notice, in between the two of them was a very small opening. And what is that very small opening in between them? Is it one of the, the external auditor? No, never mind, not that one. Stylomastoid foramen. Excellent. That one it is, is indeed right there the, on the stylomastoid foramen. It is indeed the stylomastoid foramen. And if you remember, when we looked at the inferior side of the skull, we saw that indeed this was a very small opening. We may have actually talked about this when we spoke about it at the time. Our seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve comes out of here. So let's go back to this picture, comes out of this space and goes to the face. However, as we learned, this mastoid process is actually uh, not a solid bone. There's that mastoid sinus inside of it, a big air-filled space. And as we talked about that big air-filled space, because it's filled with air open to the outside world, can become irritated, can become inflamed. And if it becomes irritated and inflamed, that swelling can squeeze that tiny opening, restricting and constricting that nerve. And it can actually stop the function of that nerve. And suddenly, no, not TMJ, although that's a good guess, suddenly, basically from the forehead down, you no longer can control your facial muscles. So you go to smile and one side goes up and the other side doesn't do anything. There we go, Bell's palsy. That condition of Bell's palsy is caused by uh, usually a, temporal con uh, a temporary constriction of that facial nerve. And there have been at least three documented cases of Bell's palsy that occurred from someone driving in a car with their window down. They were driving the car with the window down, the wind was blowing past their ear, they ended up getting a mastoid sinus infection that constricted the nerve, and suddenly half their face was paralyzed as a result of it. Now, luckily, we reduced the inflammation. Oh, wow. Reduce the inflammation. No, no, you see is a good thing. If you have the window rolled down, that's when it's the wind's blowing by. So you need that air conditioner to have the windows closed. <laughs> Al, is it from driving in a car or did it happen from something else? No, it happened from driving in the car. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Oh, not well, obvious, hopefully she recovered. So again, I, I apologize, My uh, the scientist in me always gets really excited about these things and I forget that these are real people that it's happening to. So hopefully it resolved itself and everything is okay, but that is- Oh, very I actually cool. have a question. Yeah. How long does it take for it to resolve? Great question. So it, it, it can vary dramatically. A lot of it has to do with the seriousness of the mastoid infection, especially now that we can take types of anti-inflammatories and antibiotics and things like that that can help. In many cases, it can resolve itself within a week or two. There are instances where it has lasted as long as four and six months uh, before it was finally able to fully resolve itself. So, and in very, very rare instances, if the damage to the nerve is severe enough, it can be permanent, but that's not nearly as common. Oh, it hurts it's permanent. Oh, wow. It's been so, two years now. Yeah, so. Wow. So, yes. Yeah, so, uh, again, it doesn't, it's not frequent that that occurs, but, uh, but I'm very sorry for that. Excellent. All right. So there you go. All right. Now, I do want to point one other thing out to you. Notice here on the outside of the skull, we saw the stylomastoid foramen. Did we see that stylomastoid foramen from the inside of the skull? No. No, it turns out it doesn't. And the reason for that is that what happens with our facial nerve is our facial nerve actually enters into the internal auditory meatus. If you remember, and let's go ahead and cheat and do this. When we were looking at our brainstem before, we noted how, and I made a point of emphasizing how poor little uh, cranial nerve six is here by itself, and seven and eight are BFFs. 
I made that joke about them being BFFs. Well, the reason I made that joke about them being BFFs is they actually start their journeys together. Notice cranial nerve seven and cranial nerve eight both go into the temporal bone via the internal acoustic meatus. Seven then continues down and goes out the stylomastoid foramen. So again, since it exits out the stylomastoid, Um, we consider that its skull exit because that's where it leaves the skull. But seven and eight stay together and start together. Notice eight is somewhat unique where technically it never actually leaves the skull. Eight just enters and ends inside of the temporal bone. But it does leave the cranial cavity. So for cranial nerve eight, uh, we will use the internal acoustic meatus as its skull exit. Since it exits the cranial cavity through that internal acoustic meatus, we'll just use that as its skull exit. Technically it doesn't exit the skull, but it does exit the cranial cavity through there. And so for eight, the skull exit is the internal acoustic meatus, and for seven, it's gonna be that stylomastoid foramen, okay? All right, excellent. Cranial nerve eight, functional type. What was the name? Let's do name first. What is the vestibulo, name? Vestibulocochlear. What a horrible, horrible mouthful. Way back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when I was in graduate school, uh, this was known as the auditory nerve. And in fact, the mnemonic that I learned for the cranial nerves uses an A here instead of a V. So uh, again, I, uh, uh, but with a name like auditory, it tells you obviously something very important. What do you think auditory refers to? The ear and hearing. Hearing, absolutely. But really, hearing is only half of what this nerve does. Part of it is hearing, but the other part of it is if I sat you in my office chair, which happens to be a nice swirly chair, and I swirled you around 16 times, and then I encouraged you to run out of my room and down the stairs, would that necessarily be something you would want to do? It would be entertaining, but a bad idea. Well, it'd be a very bad idea. It might be entertaining for all of us, but it wouldn't probably be entertaining to the person who was doing it, because what would likely happen to the person who did that? They'd fall down. The They'd fall down. Be why? Because I would be messing with their equilibrium and balance. Absolutely. Our, vestibular, our vestibulocochlear nerves functional type is sensory. But the key here is that there are two types of sensory information that we get from our vestibular cochlear nerve. And that is why auditory was never a good name for this one. Vestibular cochlear is more of a mouthful but like many of those alphabet soup terms we have, its name tells you everything about it. As we see here in this illustration, there are two special sensory structures. The first of those two special sensory structures is the cochlea. The cochlea is this snail shell shaped thing that's been cut but it provides us with our sense of hearing, our auditory information. The second structure over here is made up of a couple of loop -le looping, loop uh, try that again, looping structures known as the semicircular canals, but there's also this big bodied structure. 
And this big bodied structure is what is known as the vestibule. And the vestibule is what gives us our equilibrium and balance. So there are two special sensory structures, the vestibule and the cochlea here inside of the temporal bone. And so that's where this gets its name, vestibular cochlear, because it has two branches, a cochlear branch that gives us our sense of hearing and a vestibular branch that gives us our equilibrium and balance. Actually, that's a great question, uh, uh, Maximilian. Absolutely, and it doesn't necessarily, <laughs> it doesn't have to necessarily be in the doctor. But you're absolutely right. Typically, when they are rinsing out your ear for the earwax, they use warm water, and when they put warm water inside of your ear, it actually warms up the fluid in the vestibule, and you can actually start to get the sensation that you're sp spinning. This is an activity. Obviously, you don't do this by yourself. Do this with another one, someone else, someone you trust. Do this laying down on the floor. Have a blanket and, I mean, have a towel and have a bucket nearby. And here's what you do. Lay your uh, willing subject on the ground and start slowly pouring warm, not hot, warm water into their ear. And while you're doing that, watch your, their eyes. Our eyes do something really, really interesting. If you're ever in the passenger side, don't do this while you're driving. If you're in the passenger side and there's someone in the car behind you, I mean, not in the car behind you, yeah, in the, in the back seat behind you, watch them as they look out the window. Typically what happens when we look out the window is our eyes, so I'll do it this way. So our eyes lock on an object, follow that object, and then they snap to the front again, to slowly follow that and snap to the front again. And so our eyes make that kind of a movement where they scan and snap back, scan and snap back. It's called a saccade. And if you start pouring warm water into somebody's ears and watch their eyes, their eyes will start to make that kind of a saccade movement. And they will actually start to get the sensation that they are spinning. Now, for some people it can make a motion sick. That's why you have the bucket nearby. Uh, but right again, you get a little, you can feel a little uh, woozy or you can lose your equilibrium or things like that from that. So yeah, that warm water, cold water will do it as well. Uh, but both change the temperature of the fluid and upset your sense of balance. So you don't even have to spin someone around in the chair. You can just pour the, the water, warm, not hot, cool, not ice water into there. And you can see these kind of changes taking place. So it's not just hearing, it's equilibrium as well. All right. And as we mentioned, it's a little bit of a cheat, but we will use the internal acoustic or internal auditory meatus as our skull exit for cranial nerve eight. All right. Questions on that? No around time. We're doing good. Excellent. All right. What Perfect. was the brain exit for that one? The same thing? So as I mentioned, uh, again, you can use whatever you want to describe, but notice here's how I remember them. Underneath the pons, there are three cranial nerves. Six, which is towards the midline. Eight, which is the most lateral one. And seven is in between. And remember, okay, so it's we the talked outside about, best friend. Yeah, so it'd be the, yeah, so it's the outside best friend. It is the most lateral below the pons. So yeah, Thank you. on the side too, six here, seven there, and eight. So yeah, it's the most lateral of the best friends. I have a question. Yes. Um, so when somebody has a stroke and you're assessing them for a stroke and you're watching like their face, you ask them to smile, you're watching their speech um, and like their arm movements and stuff, what, um, I think I know the answer to this, but what like nerves are primarily affected by a stroke? And well, so it, it, it depends on the cause. In most instances, if someone has had a stroke, it's affecting more of the cerebrum. So when you're looking for things like 
uh, you know, lack of strength in their arms or lack of sensation in their arms or things along those lines. Uh, those are, uh, so it's usually more cortical when it's something like a stroke. Uh, typically where you see deficiencies in things like this aren't so much stroke related, although I guess it is possible that strokes can affect these kind of nerves or things along those lines, but it's often uh, more like cancerous tumors or something along those lines. If a tumor were to form in this area and start squeezing on one of these nerves, or we talked about that sinus infection that affects the facial nerve, things along those lines. So peripheral things, uh, there are other either traumas or you know swelling or tumors or things along those lines. Uh, when it is a stroke, it's typically more of the uh, cerebral cortex that you're looking at for where the deficiency might be. Okay. Yeah. All right, excellent. I think we got everything for eight then, yes? All right, so actually, since we just did this, let's go ahead and talk about it here since we've got this here. As we talked about here underneath the pawns, we have six medially, we have seven and intermediate and eight lateral. And notice from there, it continues on down, nine, 10, and 11. Now notice this illustration does a nice job of showing them individually. But let's go back to that Cosumnus River site and see what they have under the nervous system here. Um, cranial nerves, perfect. Excellent. This is what I was looking for. This is a great model uh, from the classroom. Notice again, we can clearly see and count. Notice cranial nerve one technically is not on this model because you remember cranial nerve one would be those branches that come off of the olfactory bulb. So that would be cranial nerve one. Here is cranial nerve two, three coming right here along the midline. There's four lateral, but we know coming from the back, five on the pawns, six, seven, and eight underneath the pawns. And then the reason I brought you here is notice nine, 10, and 11 are all kind of mashed together as one. Notice they do a decent job of showing, and I'll just draw the lines here. You can see that delineation in the height, you can see a little bit of a gap between them right here. But as this model shows, all of the axons from them all kind of do come together into one kind of major pathway that's going to go out one major exit. So as it turns out, 9, 10, and 11 really like to hang out with each other. And so all of them are gonna share the exact same skull exit. So if we look at a nice big inferior view, we're looking for a nice big skull feature that might be a nice big opening where not one, not two, but three cranial nerves might be able to find their way out. Does such a skull exit exist? What skull feature is this? Largest, yes. Jugular foramen. Jugular foramen, there you go, absolutely. So notice for nine, 10, and 11, all three of them are going to have the exact same skull exit. They all go out the jugular frame. Right? And we've seen this before. How many cranial nerves go through the superior orbital fissure? Four, I think. Four. What were they? Just give me their numbers. One, two, three. No, not one and two. Three does. What else? Three, four, and six, I think. Three, four, six, but someone said there were four of them, so we're missing one. Three, four, six, what other cranial nerve goes through the superior orbital fissure? 
the ophthalmic. Oh wait, yeah, yeah. ophthalmic of the trigeminal. There you go, a branch of five. So three, four, five, and six, right? At least one of the branches of five. I'll go through that. So four, pass through that. We've got three, nine, 10, and 11 that go through the jugular foramen. Excellent. All right. So let's identify. Yep, so I answered that. Cranial nerve nine. What is cranial nerve nine? Glossopharyngeal. Glossopharyngeal. Excellent. What is its functional type, sensory, motor, or both? Both. There you go. So that means it must have both a sensory and a motor function to it. And indeed it does. And again, the name tells us a lot about it. Glossopharyngeal. Glosso refers to what? Anyone know what glosso refers to? I'll start easy then. What does pharyngeal refer to? The pharynx. Yeah, the pharynx. Absolutely, right? Your muscular throat. And so not surprisingly, from a motor function, it controls many of the muscles of the pharynx, playing a role in speech, in swallowing, right? Things along those lines. Notice also it plays a role from a motor standpoint Uh, from a motor standpoint, it plays a role in uh, producing saliva by innervating one of our salivary glands that we see right here. So those are motor functions. Glosso refers to the tongue, right? That's what glosso refers to. And this glosso part is where we get our sensory function. What I like to think of and describe the, the sensory function of our cranial nerve nine is what I like to refer to as chemoreception. Chemoreception is, of course, the perception of chemicals. Notice it innervates the posterior third of the tongue. and also the palate, whoops, that's not an and, and even the uh, pharynx. But this isn't necessarily what I would call taste, right? Because when you get that chocolate chip ice cream cone, do you shove it all the way to the back of your mouth so that you can taste all that delicious sweetness and the chocolate and the mint or anything else that's on there? No, you like no. it. No, but if something is really acidic or if something you know is very salty or things along those lines, do we can we get a general sensation of the tastes of things uh, from the back of our mouth, from the roof of our mouth, from the back of our tongue. Yeah. 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 So it's not quite taste so much as chemo reception. So from within the oral cavity, we get some general taste sensations, acidity, right? You know, things like the pH, things like uh, the, you know, precursors like glucose and things along those lines. But also, as you can see here from this illustration, it innervates some very important chemoreceptors in the blood vessels. This one happens to be called the carotid bodies because it's where the carotid artery branches to the internal and external. And is it important to know the chemical composition of our blood? what the pH of our blood is, how much calcium is in the blood, how much sodium is in our blood, how many amino acids are in the blood, things along those lines? 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Notice it isn't stuff that you're consciously aware of. You can't be like, oh, I'm a quart low of calcium right now, right? It doesn't quite work that way. But is it important for your body to know when it's low on calcium and be able to affect changes because of that? Yeah, absolutely. And these carotid bodies are one of the main places we get that. So this chemical reception is both outside and inside the body. And that's kind of what it provides. In the oral cavity, right, we get some general chemical reception. And also within our blood, we get some general chemical reception. So we have sensory and we have motor here in our glossopharyngeal nerve. Excellent. And how does it get there? What's the skull exit again? Was it jugular foramen? It was indeed jugular foramen. So would skull, skull exit and brain exit be same for some of them? No. They would all be different. Brain exit is basically how you would describe where it is located on the brainstem. Again, there is no right or wrong answer, but if you think about it, uh, the way I think of uh, glossopharyngeal is we have these three nerves on the lateral aspect of the medulla oblongata. And the superior one is cranial nerve nine. So that would be a perfectly acceptable way to describe it. But whatever else helps you to describe it, that would be fine. Right? Notice it's lateral to the olive. Ooh, and let's look at that. One of the things that I want to look, if we go at this brainstem, I can kind of see it here. I wonder if they have a bit better picture. I will take a peek in a second. If you look really closely, you'll see that here, the olive is actually colored pink. So if I clear this up, you can see a little bit of pink right there. That is that olive. Notice here are our pyramids along the midline. But remember, between 9, 10, and 11, and then this right here, which is 12, right in between them right there is that pink olive. I wonder if they've got a better picture of this, like I said. Let's see. Um, thank you. Now you can kind of see it there. I go from the back. No, nope, of course not. Never have the fun view that I want. Yep. All right. So again, you can get a hint of where it is. That little bit of pink olive there in between. There it is in the pyramids. That we need to know. But um, but yeah. No side view, which would have been nice. All right. Excellent. Any more questions on nine? And of course, skull exit is the check of the frame. All right. Let's come back to this picture here for a minute. We have learned some fun and exciting things about our cranial nerves. We know six is the smallest. We know five is the largest. We know four is posterior, the only one that's on the backside of the brainstem. And now we're on to cranial nerve 10. What is the name for cranial nerve 10? Vegas. Right. And of course, as we know, Vegas means to lose lots of money, right? What does Vegas mean? Visceral? Know? Say again? Visceral? Close. That's not a bad guess. It, it, it's actually closer and has a similar root to the word vagabond. What is a vagabond or who is a vagabond? Someone who moves around and has no purpose. Well, okay, whether he has a purpose or not is debatable, but you're absolutely right in the fact that he is a wanderer. Absolutely. And that is cranial nerve 10. 
cranial nerve 10 is by far our longest cranial nerve. It is indeed a true wanderer. And in fact, if you look at our vagus nerve here in this illustration, you can see that it pretty much innervates every single organ in the ventral body cavity and more, right? Heart and lungs in the thoracic cavity, stomach, spleen, gallbladder, uh, liver, kidneys, small intestine, large intestine, uh, pancreas, which isn't even on this picture, right? Some of the muscles of the throat and larynx, right? All of this type of massive amount of wandering Well, it is definitely what's related to it. Absolutely. Uh, what ha uh, at, so as we will talk about as we move on to the next section, about 90% of our parasympathetic output comes out this cranial nerve. So what happens when someone has that vasal vagal reflex, uh, that syncope, is basically uh, due to stress or some other type of activator, uh, they get uh, an increase in activation of their parasympathetic nervous system, slows the heart rate, drops the blood pressure, and as we lower the heart rate and drop the blood pressure, less blood can go to the brain, and as a result of it, they can get dizzy and actually pass out as a result of it. Yeah, that, that can happen as well, absolutely. Uh, in the case of the intra-abdominal pressure, it has more to do with, uh, again, that force of the pressure uh, slowing down the movement of the blood, slowing down the, the pumping of the blood out of the heart, and those kind of things can, uh, can decrease blood flow back to the heart, decrease and drug cause blood pressure to drop from that as well. Absolutely. Now, obviously, parasympathetic output, so it, controls the heart, it controls the, the, so it gives us motor control from. But if we're gonna have these nerves going to all these different organs of the body, is it just gonna be motor out? What is the functional type of a nerve for our vagus nerve? It's both. Yeah, it's both. So not only is it motor control from, but uh, uh, motor control too, sorry, but also sensory information from basically most organs in the ventral body cavity. Now, again, it plays a huge important role in our parasympathetic nervous system and we will talk about its function in more detail there. But when we're talking about it just as cranial nerve 10 and part of the cranial nerves, I am satisfied with that more generic description of what it does. So if I ask you for the specific function of the vagus nerve, you can simply say that it provides motor control to and sensory information from most of the organs of the ventral body cavity. And of course, how does it get there? Skull exit. The jugular foramen. There you go. Excellent. All right. Questions on that? Excellent. Two more. Cranial nerve 11. What is cranial nerve 11? Accessory. And it is perfectly acceptable to say accessory nerve. However, some also refer to it as the spinal accessory nerve. Both of those are acceptable names. I only make a point of mentioning it because again, if you've started doing some uh, inter Google searches to try to find some fun mnemonics, sometimes you will see an A here, sometimes you will see an S here. And this up close view actually shows us why it gets that name spinal accessory. This is a cranial nerve. 
It has to come out of the cranial cavity. But if you notice, what's interesting about it is many of the axons that form this cranial nerve actually start on the spinal cord. And because they start on the spinal cord, they actually have to go back up into the cranial cavity through that nice big hole that is that foramen magnum. And once they come back up into the cranial cavity, then they're able to leave out the jugular foramen. So the jugular foramen is still their skull exit. But what is interesting about some of these is some of these axons that form this cranial nerve actually have to come back into the skull before they can exit. And notice they've done a nice job of showing that on our illustration. Notice here we see some of those axons coming up the spinal cord to form that accessory nerve. All right, so its anatomy is a little wonky, but its function is very straightforward. What is its functional type? Sensory, motor, or both? Motor. Motor. And its primary job is to basically hold your head in place. Whoops, where is it? There you go. This is the picture I wanted. I was so busy on the nerves, I forgot this is what I wanted to see. It helps to stabilize the head and hold the head in place. Notice it does that by primarily controlling the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. Right? These are muscles that we know attach to the head of the, you know, to the to the base of the head and basically help to stabilize the head and keep the head in place. So this one basically holds our heads up. And to completely beat the dead horse, what is the skull exit of cranial nerve 11? Also jugular foramen. There you go. And so what that leaves us with last but absolutely not least is cranial nerve 12. What is the name of cranial nerve 12? Hypoglossal. Excellent. We know glossal now means tongue. What does hypo mean? Under or below. Yeah, exactly. And notice that's exactly what we see from this one. This nerve comes up underneath the tongue, connecting to the muscles of the tongue. And what is its functional type? Motor. Motor, right? We've already done taste. We've already done tactile sensation and pain. We've done all of the sensory stuff we can do with the tongue. So what our hypoglossal nerve does is it controls both the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the tongue. So I guess the only question was that with that is what the heck's the difference? What is an intrinsic muscle and what does it do? What is an extrinsic muscle and what does it do? Well, let's start easy. What do you think I mean when I say an intrinsic muscle? What does intrinsic mean? What does is in it, mean? Is it like uh, muscles that are like deep layer muscles? It, uh, it isn't so much that they are deep, but I, I like where you're going with that. Intrinsic muscles, it isn't so much whether they're superficial or deep. The key to an intrinsic muscle is it is a muscle that is completely contained within the tongue. So the entire bundle of muscle cells all are contained within the tongue. This is different from an extrinsic muscle which would start in the tongue and come out and anchor to something else. And in fact, being the smart, clever, sophisticated students that you are, what is the primary structure that most of these extrinsic muscles are gonna connect themselves to? If only there was a bone that I knew of that was a movable base of the tongue. The hy hyoid? There you go. 
most of the extrinsic muscles are going to connect to the hyoid, which conveniently enough, we see right here in our illustration. Here's the hyoid bone right here. We see some extrinsic muscles that are traveling into the tongue. And then the, ex the intrinsic muscles uh, would be the ones that are completely contained within the tongue. So then the only question, now that we know what an intrinsic and extrinsic muscle is, we just have to figure out what they do. What do you think an extrinsic muscle does? Well, these are the ones that are attached to the hyoid bone. And what's the advantage of being attached to a bone? You have a base. Yeah. And what can you do from a base? Move it. Move it, exactly. How many people here can stick their tongue out? Move it left, move it light, move it up, move it down. All right. That ability to move your tongue through space is what the extrinsic muscles do. And as Daniel pointed out, how many of you can roll your tongue? Change the shape of your tongue, make it flat, make it circular, put, uh, put uh, uh, ripples in it. That ability to change the shape of your tongue is what the intrinsic muscles do. So intrinsic muscles are inside the tongue and they change the shape of the tongue. Extrinsic muscles extend out of the tongue and they move the tongue through space and our hypoglossal nerve controls both. So then the only last question we have is how does that hypoglossal nerve get to the tongue? Anyone remember? Hypoglossal canal? Yeah, if you remember, just here, superior to the condyle, above the occipital condyle, was a small hole. I think I have one more picture. Now, here's the picture from your lab manual. It doesn't really show the hole, but it shows that there is that canal, that hypoglossal canal, that passageway superior to the occipital condyle, which is where that nerve comes out and goes to the tongue. And that is our hypoglossal nerve, Functional type motor, skull exit, hypoglossal canal, controls the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the tongue, or moves the tongue in space and changes the shape of the tongue. And just that simply, we have identified all the information you are responsible for on all of the cranial nerves. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Let's go ahead then and take our first break. I'll stop sharing that because we don't need it anymore. Get rid of that. We are going to go back to our spinal cord for the lecture now. So let's go ahead and take our first break. Oops, that's what I want. Uh, looks like it is 1.30 now, so let's go ahead and we will restart at 1.45, and I will start the recording at that point. I have a quick question. Yes. We're going to turn in the cranial nerves on the sheet we just worked on? No. Again, okay. that is a study guide for you. As I've pointed out, we are running a little bit behind, so I don't know how much sensory stuff we get to. And at this point, even if we get a chance to talk about it, I don't imagine too much of it will be on your lab exam. So what that means is if the sensory stuff doesn't end up on your lab exam, as much as 25% of your lab exam could be basically one of those four questions on your handout. Right? I can point at a model or a chart or an illustration or something like that and ask you to identify the cranial nerve by name and number, ask you for its functional type, ask you for its specific function, or ask you for its skull exit. So basically one of those four questions on one of those 12 nerves, it could be as much as 25% of your lab exam. 
And anything that important, is it likely to show up on a lecture exam in an essay question or two as well? Maybe some multiple choice questions? Yeah, probably. So no, you don't have to turn that in. If you didn't want to fill it out, you don't have to, but you're definitely responsible for the information. All right, yeah. questions on that? All right, excellent. I will see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. We are switching gears now and moving back to uh, the spinal cord to finish off our uh, anatomy from that and then some functions of that as well. Uh, let's go ahead. If you remember, we left off last time, we had looked at the spinal cord. Uh, we saw how it has that uh, central canal at the center and it has those three uh, enlargements, the gray matter, uh, the big, huge uh, anterior gray horns, lateral gray horns, posterior gray horns. Our dorsal root with our dorsal root ganglion. Our ventral root. And those come together to the spinal nerve. And then from there, we left off talking about how we have that small branch that is the dorsal ramus that goes to the muscle in the skin of the back. We have those two ramy communicantes, uh, the gray ramus medially and the white ramus laterally that play a role in our sympathetic nervous system. And then we have the largest of those branches that we call the ventral ramus. And the ventral ramus, as we talked about, goes to the anterior part of the body as well as the appendages, the limbs, the arms and the legs. And again, of course, we have 31 spinal nerves. So obviously we have 31 ventral rami. But again, doesn't mean we're just going to go to 31 individual locations. Uh, most, again, keyword there being most, most means not all, but most of the ventral rami combine with other uh, Ramy to form big elaborate networks of nerves. And if you remember the term we use for a big elaborate network of nerves is a plexus. So again, let's go back real fast. I did the drawing, but here we see it here. And again, the last thing that I wanted to remind you about is remember our sensory information comes in through the dorsal root to the posterior gray horn, our motor, both autonomic and somatic go out uh, the ventral root. Excellent question. A ganglion is a cluster of cell bodies. So these are the cell bodies. And as we saw in the previous one, there are those unipolar sensory neurons located within this particular ganglion, other than the dorsal root. So that is the ganglion. A plexus, as we see here, is an elaborate network of nerves. So these are bundles of axons that are meshed together into this big elaborate network. A plexus just basically means uh, mesh-like or, or network-like structure. So we have these plexes. And there are four primary plexes that are formed by the majority of our ventral roots, our ventral rami, with the exception, as we can see here in the illustration, of the ones in the thoracic region. The majority of the ones in the thoracic region just go along those uh, intercostal grooves that we saw on our ribs, but the rest of them form these plexes. Now, for these plexes, you are going to be responsible for identifying the plexus. So you need to identify the plexus. Uh, you are gonna be responsible for knowing which ventral rami form the four plexes and uh, the portion of the body that the rami, uh, that the plexus innervates. Lastly, for each, I will give you one or more specific nerves. Many of them are ones that you've heard of uh, that you will be responsible for knowing the function of. So let's do this. Let's go through our four plexes 
and identify all of the information you are responsible for for them. And more importantly, take a closer look at them as well. Here we have our superior most plexus. It is the cervical plexus. It is made up of the ventral rames from uh, spinal cord uh, segments C1 through C5. And as we can see, its primary function is to help to innervate uh, sensory, I mean, uh, motor function of and sensory information from, because remember it's sensory and motor, uh, for the head, neck, and shoulders. Notice our accessory cranial nerve, which we know controls the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid, comes in as a part of this as well. Notice our hypoglossal nerve comes through this as well on its way to the tongue. And we have all of these others in here as well. Now, again, you don't need to know the names of all of these branches. However, if you look closely, there is one very interesting nerve I do want to mention. Notice this particular nerve right here is made up of branches from ventral ramus C3, from ventral ramus C4, and from ventral ramus C5. These three together have axons, so C3, C4, and C5 all come together uh, in part to form a nerve we call the phrenic nerve. Anyone know what the phrenic nerve innervates? Anyone here heard of the phrenic nerve before? Know what it does? Uh, diaphragm? Exactly. The phrenic nerve is what controls the diaphragm. Excellent. Where's your diaphragm located? Right under the lungs. True, under the lungs, or if you think about it, under the ribs, way down here, right? This cervical plexus does the head, neck, and shoulders, right? Right now, my head, neck, and shoulders are in the field of view. Can you see my diaphragm or where my diaphragm would be in the field of view right now? No. 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 So why is this nerve so crazily displaced? Why well, have something that goes all the way down to the diaphragm coming off of the cervical plexus? Doesn't seem like it belongs there, does it? So why is it there? Does it aid in like um, breathing, like helping the diaphragm move? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. What the phrenic nerve does is control the diaphragm. And as you have pointed out, we use the diaphragm to breathe. And just out of curiosity, how important is it that you breathe? It's pretty, pretty important. important. Yeah, pretty darn important, absolutely. As we have learned, if you damage a portion of the spinal cord, Right? You lose all of the function underneath that damage. Remember, we talked about when you get that epidural injection, when you're getting you're ready to give birth. Yes, it stops the pain from the belly down, but it also stops your ability to be able to walk either. So instead of an injection, if you had an injury in that lower part of the spinal cord, you may be a paraplegic where you can't move anything from the waist down. Right? If you had an injury in the top part of your spinal cord, you could lose all function from your head down. What do we call that kind of a person? A person who has no control of their body below their head? Quadriplegic. A quadriplegic, absolutely. Right, You could have damage. And in fact, most spinal cord injuries typically occur from C7 down. So if at about the C7, C8 area, you had an injury to the spinal cord, you couldn't move your arms, you couldn't move your legs, yeah, you couldn't move your waist, right? You couldn't do any of those types of things, having problem defecating and things along those lines. But are you still able to breathe and talk? Yes. Yeah. yeah. The advantage of having the phrenic nerve way up here coming off the cervical plexus is that it is more protected it is above the area where most spinal cord injuries are going to occur. 
So by having this way up at the top, it helps to maintain the ability to breathe, which is super duper important. In fact, that's the mnemonic they use to remember it. C3, four, and five keep you alive. Of course, helps if I spell keep correctly. There you go. Keep you alive. So that phrenic nerve keeps you alive. It keeps you breathing. And it comes way up here off of our cervical plexus. All right. Questions on that? All right, that's all we need to know for that one. Let's look at our next plexus. The next plexus is the brachial plexus. This brachial plexus is by far the most complicated. Uh, now it doesn't connect them. So if you notice, if we go back, uh, so remember, as we talked about, and let's just look at it from this one here. Each ramus, this is the one ramus that comes off, but notice the axons that make it branch to go all sorts of different directions in different locations. So again, remember a, a nerve is made up of hundreds, if not thousands of axons. And so when they come out that ventral ramus, they branch and go all sorts of different ways. So if you notice our phrenic nerve down here is made up of axons that come off of ventral root C5. It is made of axons that come off of ventral root C4. And it's made of axons that come off of ventral root C3. So basically axons from C3, axons from C4, axons from C5, all of those come together to form that phrenic nerve. So yeah, so it's not just one axon that's going to the diaphragm, it's many and coming off of those three rainy. Okay. Excellent. All right. Here it is. The second most beautiful structure in the body. Of course, the first is, of course, the retina of the eye. Uh, but the second is this brachial plexus. It is by far the most elaborate plexus. And as you can see, it has a tremendous organization to it. It starts with our ramies, notice made up of axons coming out of C4 through T1 of our spinal cord. So those are the ventral ramies that it comes out of. But those come together to form our divisions uh, from the, I mean, from, uh, so those trunks, those trunks go to different divisions. Those divisions go to different branches. It's got this big elaborate organization thing, five trunks into three, uh, five roots into three trunks, into two divisions, into three cords, into six important nerves. And if we had more time in this class, I would make you learn and draw this, but I'm not going to, so you don't have to worry about all of that. What you do need to know, not surprisingly, if the brachial plexus is the most elaborate plexus, it's primarily involved in controlling our arm, which is arguably the most dexterous of all of our structures. Now, while you don't need to know all the paths and everything associated with it, there are six important nerves that associate with some of the muscles we've talked about. And so you do need to know which nerves go with which muscles. For instance, our musculocutaneous nerve goes to the flexors of the elbow. What were the muscles that were the flexors of the elbow? Brachioradialis. Excellent. What else? What else flexes the elbow? Come on, Bicep's people. Break, yeah. yeah, there you go. And the triceps. Does the triceps uh, flex the elbow or extend the elbow? Extend. Extend the yes. elbow. So what's the other one that was deep to the biceps brachia that flexes the elbow? Was it brachy brachialis? Yeah, there you go. There you go, brachialis. That seems like another lifetime that we learned those. Yeah, and it was, like three weeks. So yeah, it was truly another lifetime ago. <laughs> Excellent. Median and ulnar nerves are the flexors of the wrist and the hand. What were the flexors of the wrist and the hand that we learned? Uh, 
the Plexer, yeah, Polaris, Verdialis. And there was one more. The longest. Yeah, Palmaris longest. There you go. Excellent. This is a cumulative class, right? Excellent. All right. Let's talk about something else. Notice I didn't well, mention. You just undid all the things you wrote. What? You just erased everything you wrote underneath media and owner. No, I just moved it up here. Oh, okay. I, I looked away for a second and I was so confused. Yep. I waited till you looked away so that I moved it to confuse you. All right. Notice, again, I'm not holding you responsible for the divisions. But if you look closely at this illustration, basically there's two main colors down the arm. There are the yellow, which are the nerves that are in the front of the arm. And there are the green that are the nerves in the back of the arm. Notice when we get to the elbow, your radial nerve, which is a posterior nerve, actually comes to the front of the elbow to be protected, right? Because after all, we want all of our nerves protected in the elbow, except for one minor problem. Notice this anterior nerve, your ulnar nerve, which is on the front, rather than staying in the front compartment of the elbow, actually goes around the backside, around that medial condyle, putting it in a very exposed position underneath the medial condyle. So if you hit that ulnar nerve at just the right angle, or just the wrong angle, depending on how you think of it, you get a tingling sensation that runs all the way down your hand, and everybody else thinks it's hysterical. What do we call that irritation of the ulnar nerve? There you go, hitting your funny bone. Hitting your funny bone is the irritation of that weird ulnar nerve that moves its way out of the way, exposing itself for whatever reason it does it. No one knows why it does it, but there it is, exposing itself in that way, giving you that tingling sensation. Excellent. Uh, your radial nerve, which is a posterior nerve, as we talked about, does the shoulder and elbow extensors. And now you get your chance to say it. What's the primary extensor of the shoulder and the elbow? The tricep. Of course, can you get away with just saying triceps on the exam? No. Triceps brachia. Triceps brachia. There you go. Excellent. Our triceps brachia is located there. Excellent. Your axillary nerve, notice, is up here near the shoulder. So it innervates things like the deltoid, like the teres minor. And there's one more nerve we don't necessarily see very well on this illustration, but if we look at this one, notice right off the bat, let's not use blue because it doesn't stand out. There are all these axons that come down and form the long thoracic. And the long thoracic is the one that innervates that serratus anterior. Remember, that's the one we talked about holds the scapula up against your wall of your thoracic cavity helps to squeeze the chest to breathe out. And we talked about if this nerve is injured, if you have a like a pulling or twisting of the arm, a stretching of this uh, compression from an injury, or sometimes this plexus can be damaged and irritated during childbirth. As the baby is being pulled through the birthing canal, uh, these nerves can be stretched and irritated. And as a result of that, the scapula can wing off the back of the baby and they can have some problems with the movement of their arms. Now, usually those, tra those traumas are typically temporary and they heal from it, but uh, in some cases it can cause complications and issues. So that long thoracic goes straight down. So you notice now here, if we see here and we cheat and go back to the previous picture, we can see how basically that long thoracic is gonna come right off of here and go to that serratus anterior, which wraps around the ribs to the back of the scapula. So it comes straight down to that. So those, again, four uh, nerves 
all involving muscles that we have already talked about in this class. So that should be pretty easy as well. All right, questions on that. On this picture, this is just showing the um, brachial nerves, right? Like because the cervical plexus comes from yes, some of those is, also? Yes, this is just showing the, the brachial plexus. And notice here, let's actually go back. That's a great question. I like that question a lot. Notice if we go back here, notice as you can see, for instance, the S, there is some overlap. C4 and C5 do have some axons that come up to the cervical plexus but they have other axons that come down here into the brachial plexus. So yeah, there is some overlap of these plexes. And notice we're gonna see the same thing in the lumbar. Notice L4 is gonna be part of the lumbar plexus and it's gonna be a part of the sacral plexus as well. So yes, there is some overlap on the edges because these nerves are branching out to go all over the place. Great Thank question. You. Yep. And again, to emphasize the point on the exam, I am not going to show you this picture with an arrow pointing right here and say, identify this nerve or something like that. That's not what I'm doing on this. But uh, could I ask you what nerve innervates the bicep brachia? Yeah, absolutely. Or what nerve innervates the serratus anterior? Yes, absolutely. So I'm not going to show you this picture and ask you to identify anything from this. But uh, do you need to know what the nerves do by name and by their function? Yes. So, so one ask you that like by pointing at something like this, but uh, you do need to know the functions of the nerves we've identified. All righty. Uh, next is our lumbar plexus. Lumbar plexus, as you can see, is made up of uh, axons coming out of L1 through L5. Not nearly as elaborate as the brachial plexus. Uh, and as you can see, it innervates uh, much of the wall of the abdominal uh, pelvic cavity. Uh, this is, innervates the external genitalia and basically the anterior and the medial part of the leg. It is made up, as I mentioned, of axons coming out of ventral roots. L1 through L5. And as you can see, there are many important nerves here, but the one I want to talk about is this one right here, the femoral. Uh, if we cheat, let's do this. Uh, let's go back here. Let us come on. stuff. There we go. All right. If we go to the torso, maybe. There we go. This is what I want. Although ironically, this doesn't show it, but that's okay. Oh, it does. It's just white. Okay. Excellent. Notice here is our friend that we've talked about before, the inguinal ligament. The inguinal ligament is where, remember, where all of our muscles of the abdominal pelvic cavity uh, connect to it. Our, our iliopsoas comes out through it here. And where that iliopsoas comes out, there is actually a region in the indentation of the muscles indicated right here, known as the inguinal triangle. This inguinal triangle, as you can see, is where the femoral artery, the femoral vein, uh, and the femoral nerve come through. Uh, some of you who are EMTs or have worked in an emergency room before, you may be aware of if someone has a major bleeding of the leg and you're not able to put a tourniquet on it, what they recommend is that you take your palm of your hand and you press it against that inguinal triangle. And by doing that, you can uh, depress the femoral artery and hope to stop the blood loss going to the leg, right? So it can congest that area, stop the blood loss and hopefully save their life. 
and many people across the country and across the world have done that. However, as you can see, the problem with that is that the femoral nerve is located right next to it. Now, while most people would rather be alive than bleeding out, if you're a little too aggressive with your palm there in that region, while you're stopping the blood loss in the femoral artery, you could also be crushing the femoral nerve. And so the person lives, but now they're walking with a limp where they've lost movement and sensory information on the inside of their leg, the medial aspect of their leg, right? And because of the litigious society that we live in, are they happy about that and buy you flowers and thank you for saving your life, for saving their life? No, no they, they probably sue you. No, they sue you, exactly, they sue you, which is why before you save anybody's life, make sure they sign the waiver, right? Because as you know, no good deed goes unpunished. All right, so again, that's a big important nerve found in this very, very important clinical region, and that is the femoral uh, nerve. Excellent. Now, as we said, that lumbar plexus is relatively uh, simple, but it's not the simplest of our plexes. By far the least elaborate of all of our plexes is this one here, the sacral plexus. Notice the sacral plexus it comprised of uh, Ramy axons coming out of Ramy L4 through S5 coming together for this. And this particular plexus is where we actually find our largest nerve. The largest nerve in the body is the sciatic nerve. As I'm sure you remember, the sciatic nerve comes out that big indentation in the ilium, the greater sciatic notch. It basically travels down the entire posterior aspect of your leg all the way to the plantar surface of your foot by far the largest of all of the nerves in your body. And because of its location, and because of the fact that being upright is evolutionarily a relatively new phenomenon, the musculature of the back isn't necessarily as efficiently arranged as possible. So if you are lifting uh, too much heavy weight or lifting things improperly, those muscles can become inflamed and irritated, can push on that nerve. And as they push on that nerve, you get this tingling sensation, this pain or this numbness that goes down your entire leg all the way to your foot, a weakness sensation, right? That irritation. And what do we call that condition? Sciatica. sciatica. Sciatica, absolutely. Sciatica is an irritation of the sciatic nerve. And anyone who's ever dealt with it knows it really can radiate all the way down your leg, all the way to the bottom of your foot as a result of that. Because again, it is that big, huge, large, longest of all of the nerves in the body. All right. Questions on that? All right. Notice these plexi. Oh, question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So the special um, nerves that you are pointing out, those are the ones you want us to know. But the other ones on the screen are just there for our like education. No, it's just because I'm using the picture in your textbook, and the picture in your textbook has all of them on them. But okay. I am. You are only responsible for the specific ones that I have pointed out to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yep. All right. So. If, again, we've identified the four plexes, we know which ventral rami uh, uh, um, are used to form them, we know the regions of the body that they go to, and we know some of the specific nerves. But notice what we've seen is that these nerves go to specific parts of the body, and this is something that can be mapped very specifically. We can actually see which regions of the body are innervated by which spinal nerves. And we can actually draw that map in something that looks like this. And these individual regions are what are known as dermatomes. So these dermatomes are basically strips of the surface of the skin 
that indicate where these nerves are innervating, the skin and the muscles underlying them. Now, the nice thing about this is you get a nice, cool, pretty picture that shows how this works. But from a clinical standpoint, this can be very, very important. If someone is wheeled into the, uh, if someone is wheeled into the emergency room with a spinal cord injury and you want to assess where that injury is, well, basically what you start to do is you take your probe and you touch them here on the foot. Do you feel this? No. 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 Do you feel this? Yes. What about this? No. What about this? Yes. What about this? No. What about this? Yes. What about this? No. And just that quickly, you are able to see that the spinal cord injury is probably between the L2 and L3 region of the spinal cord. I see your question, I'll get to it in a second. The other way this is important is, uh, for instance, retroviruses. Shingles is a great example. Shingles is basically a retrovirus that lives in your spinal cord. And when triggered by stress, diet, all sorts of other things that can potentially cause it, that basically virus expresses itself out on the surface of the skin. And what happens is people will get a rash that appears, but that rash doesn't appear in just a random area. Typically they will have it like on a stripe on the surface of the skin or something like that. And that tells you that that virus happens to be living in the T8, T9 region of the spinal cord. Uh, no, typically this is not uh, what they're doing with acupuncture. With acupuncture, uh, what they, uh, the theory of acupuncture is that regions of the body relate to a specific internal organs of the body. And so for, by, for instance, putting pressure on one part of the hand or one part of the foot, uh, you can improve function of the stomach or something along, the low, along those lines. And uh, the nerves don't really function that way. No, this is just those nerves, those ventral roots, those axons coming out of the spinal cord coming to these regions. Uh, Emily, you had a question. Yes, um, I just had a question with us talking about the nerves and everything. Um, my question was, for example, if someone ends up like shattering their spine and then getting it rebuilt and everything, uh, can it uh, damage the nerves as well? And then how bad can it damage it? So yes, typically, well, again, as we know, the spinal cord bodies, right, uh, bear the weight and then we know we have those peduncles and the lamina, and those basically surround the spinal cord. So the spinal cord passes through that uh, vertebral foramen. When someone shatters their spinal cord, typically what they're doing is they're causing damage to the mass of the bodies, right? So like we talked about, you're rollerblading or ice skating or something like that, or you fall off of a, a chair or a bunk bed or something and you compress or you crush those vertebrae. It is typically the vertebrae that is damaged in that case and that affects your ability to stand upright, be mobile, be things along those lines. Uh, it doesn't have to affect the spinal cord and we know the spinal cord has all those protections around it but if that damage to the vertebral column is severe, severe enough, especially if you have a displacement of the bones when that occurs, is it possible that it could damage the spinal cord? Yes. So it, it is certainly possible to break the bones of the vertebrae without damaging the spinal cord. But at the same time, if you're having a trauma that is significant enough to break the bones of your vertebral column, there is a chance that spinal cord damage could occur as well. Okay, thank you. Now, because yep. the reason why I was asking is because um, I have a coworker who shattered his a spine twice and has rods mm -hmm. and those rods were like coming undone and he was having like major pain as well and so, so i just when the, so when when vertebrae are damaged typically what they will do is they will insert rods between or across the damaged vertebrae to stabilize because again one of the major functions of our vertebral column is to give us our vertical axis, 
to allow us to stand upright and balance and do things along those lines, all right? The problem with, with either fusing them or putting the rods in there to hold them together is you do lose flexibility of movement of them. But depending on the severity, depending on how well the bone is healed, right, and the fact that, again, there is a tremendous amount of stress, it is possible that with time, twisting and turning and bending can weaken these connections and can cause problems. And yes, as the spinal cord flexes or bends, it does have the potential to, uh, to affect either the spinal cord going uh, through them, or remember, as we also know, in between the vertebrae is where the nerves come out. So what could be happening is as the vertebrae are changing positions, they could be putting pressure on the nerves that are leaving. So that can cause pain and radiation and weakness to parts of the body and not just to the whole spinal cord itself as well. Yep. Thank you. Yep, great question. Any others? All right, so. Last thing we have to talk about is, as we mentioned, our spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. And as such, its job is to process information and to make decisions. And as we talked about, when our spinal cord makes the decision, what do we call that? A reflex. reflex. Reflex, absolutely. We call that a reflex. Now, reflexes, how would you define a reflex? Something you did without like consciously making a decision to do. Excellent. Perfect. I like that. So one of the things about it is it is involuntary. It's not something we have to think about. How else would you define a reflex? I guess, I don't know if it's always, but it's usually a quick movement. Yeah, absolutely. That's the whole point of it, right? If I put my hand on something hot, I don't want that information coming to my conscious brain going, hey, my hand on something hot, that really hurts. Yeah, this kind of sucks. We might want to move that. Yeah, moving, it's a good idea. Let's do that. And then I move my hand out of the way, right? Instead, I touch something hot and I pretty much pull my hand away before I even am aware of the fact that I should be cursing. So absolutely, the fact that we it is involuntary allows it to be fast. And absolutely, Arvek, you've got that absolutely right. The other key factor of a reflex is it is predictable. What does that mean? We know what will happen. Exactly. If it's right? like one of the things the doctor does is when you come into the office is he takes the hammer and hits you in the knee. And when he hits you in the knee, what happens? You kick. kick the yeah, your leg kicks out, absolutely. If he hits you in the knee and your arm goes up in the air, guess what? You're going in for more testing, right? Because that's not what's supposed to happen. So absolutely, the key to all reflexes, oh, I didn't mean to delete all of that. The key to all reflexes are all reflexes are fast, they are involuntary, and they are predictable. You give it a particular stimulus, like hitting it in the knee, and you get a particular response, like your leg kicking out. And again, this is true for all reflexes. Because there are different types of reflexes. Right? Reflexes can be spinal reflexes and cranial reflexes. And what do you think the difference between the two is? Where they're processed? True. Part of it's uh, not so much process, but you got the right idea, which nerves are involved. So when the doctor hits you in the knee with the hammer and your leg kicks out, which do you think that is, a spinal reflex or a cranial reflex? Spinal, spinal, spinal. with movement. Yeah. When he shines that light in your eye and your pupil constricts, which type is that? Cranial. 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 Because which nerves are involved? Cranial. Which cranial nerves are involved in that shining the light in your eye and having your pupil constrict? The optic nerve. Okay. That's where the sensory, the light comes in. 
And the pupil constriction, which one is responsible for that? Oculomotor. There you go. Excellent. So two and three. Perfect. Excellent. Love synthesis of information. You guys are making me happy. Excellent. Reflexes can be somatic or autonomic. What do you think the difference here is? One, uh, like one in like in your body, like a, uh, like a heart reflex. Like you see something and your heart starts pumping. Which effector is involved? Absolutely, right. You got the right idea. So, when you see that bear with an axe and it scares you, right? What kind of uh, reflex is that? Fight or flight. True. So would that be somatic or would that be autonomic? Autonomic. Autonomic, right? Autonomic, as we know, controls smooth muscle, a cardiac muscle, and glands, right? Whereas somatic reflexes control what? Rest and digest. No, nope, not a bad guess, but no. What are our other types of effectors? Or skeletal muscle? Skeletal muscle. So when the doctor hits you in the knee with a hammer, is that a somatic reflex or an autonomic reflex? Somatic. Somatic, because your leg kicking out is skeletal muscle. When he shines the light in your eye and your pupil constricts, is that somatic or autonomic? Autonomic. Autonomic, because it's the smooth muscle of your eye that is changing shape. Excellent. Is there anything about the movement that differentiates them, or is it just based on where they're located? It's not so much where they're located, it's what the effector is. Right. If it is if it is controlling, if the reflex controls skeletal muscle, then it is somatic. If the reflex controls smooth muscle or cardiac muscle or glands, it's autonomic. OK, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Reflexes can be innate or they can be learned. What does that mean? Like it's either something you're born with or it's something that you like learn to react to. Exactly, right? We as newborn babies are born with certain innate reflexes. If you take a newborn baby and you touch it on its cheek, what will that newborn baby do? Try to put your it, finger. turn yeah. towards it. It will turn to it and try to latch on. It is born with that latching reflex, which helps for the feeding of it, right? As it comes out, right? Basketball gets papped out, touch it on the cheek, and it will try to latch on right away. However, if you take that newborn baby and put it in a car going 30 miles an hour and then roll a basketball out in front of it, will that baby both try to slam on the brakes and put his arm out to try to hold on to the person next to them? No. No. Yeah. Right. Or if you're teaching your teenager to drive, right, and that car pulls out, even though it's a half a mile away, that car pulls out in front of you. And even though you're in the passenger side, you try to slam on that brake for them. Right. Is baby born with that? No. No. Or best of all, knock, knock. Who's there? Pavlov, just checking. Who's Pavlov? I don't know. Come on, yeah. yeah, there you go. Guy who tested dogs, right? Learned reflexes. He was the guy that showed a steak to a dog and rang a bell. And when the dog saw and smelled the steak, he salivated. And then he showed him a steak and rang a bell. And then he showed him a steak and rang a bell. And eventually, all he had to do was ring a bell, and the dog would start salivating in anticipation of seeing the food. Right, that was an acquired reflex, one that that dog learned. Right, I know psychology jokes are not the best. They're not quite as bad as chemistry jokes. Chemistry jokes are the worst. Right, two chemists walk into a bar. The first one says, "I'll have a glass of H two O." The second one says, "I'll have H two O 2 and the second one dies. 
peroxide. There you go. Exactly. See, told you. Even even chemistry's jokes are horrible. Chemist really again, nothing good has ever come from chemistry. Chemistry is the worst. All right, excellent. Lastly, two actually not lastly, two more. Uh, when we talk about a reflex, a reflex can be inhibitory or excitatory. What do you think the difference here is? Whether it creates a movement or prevents movement. Oh, great. Or, or reaction. decreases, right, decreases or inhibits an action or, right, increases or starts an action. Excellent. You have absolutely the right idea. For instance, if something increased my heart rate, that would be excitatory. If something decreased my heart rate, it would be inhibitory, right? Pavlov's thing increased saliva production. Right, and so it would. Uh, so that was excitatory. If instead, when he showed the dogs the steak, he whacked them in the head with a hammer, and then he showed them a steak and whacked them in the head with a hammer, right? By the time he just showed them a steak, right, he probably wouldn't start salivating in response to that because he would be expecting to be hit in the head. So that would be more of an inhibitory. Again, I'm not encouraging you, encouraging anyone to hit anybody in the head with a hammer, even dogs. But you get the idea increase in the activity or decrease in the activity of. I think those are the ones that make sense. These are the things that kind of make sense to us. But remember, we are talking about wired reflexes, right? Nerves, making connections, uh, making relationships to each other. And when we talk about these reflexes, they can either be monosynaptic or polysynaptic. What do you think it means to be monosynaptic? There's only one synapse. And if we only have one synapse, how many neurons can we have? One. One. Well, close. With a reflex, you have to have sensory coming in, you have to have motor coming out. If they only form one synapse, you have one sensory neuron coming in, one motor neuron coming out. So with one synapse, you can only have two neurons. Because right? after all, to have a synapse, you have to have what the neuron is talking to. So we have one synapse with two neurons. And then obviously a polysynaptic uh, reflex can have two or more synapses. And to have two or more synapses, you must have three or more neurons. So again, this is just from a hard wiring standpoint. Uh, we will talk about that and we'll see some examples of these in just a second. And I think we started talking about these terms enough where it can make sense of it. Contralateral and ipsilateral. What does ipsilateral mean? One-sided. Yeah. So, for instance, I touch something hot with my right hand and I pull my hand, my right hand away. Notice all of that occurred on the right side of my body. The pain information came into my spinal cord, made a decision, went back out my right, and as a result, I pulled my hand away. But what if instead I'm walking and as I'm walking, I step on something really, really sharp or really, really hot. Do I just pull my leg away and then fall down as a result of that? Both. No, what would happen is not only would I pull away the leg that I hurt, but I would also extend my other leg to maintain my balance. In that case, notice I have to have information going to both sides. So in that case, that would be a contralateral. So in this one, information crosses the body. So ipsilateral, all the information stays on one side. Contralateral, all the information uh, uh, well, not all the information, but some of the information crosses. All right. These are all possible types of reflexes, and you definitely, absolutely, positively need to know this. However, 
I am going to talk about some specific types. And for these specific types, there are, your book actually does a nice job of describing four of them. There's only two I am going to hold you responsible for. And all of them are spinal. All of them are somatic. And uh, so we're going to talk about two spinal somatic reflexes. And for our purposes, we'll focus just on the ipsilateral of them. So we are going to learn two spinal somatic ipsilateral reflexes, and one of them could very likely be on the exam. Now, the good news is this really isn't new information for you. If you think about it, on, I'm pretty sure, the second day of class, we talked about this. We talked about the ability to maintain homeostasis. And that ability to maintain homeostasis basically is what most reflexes do. And if you think about it, there were five things we needed for this, right? The first thing we needed was some type of disturbance. Let's actually just go ahead and draw this. There is some type of disturbance, something that upsets our balance. If there is a disturbance, what do we need next? Um, input. Okay, you got the right idea. If someone was breaking into your car right now, would it change your behavior right now while you're sitting here in the classroom? Yes. Really? Would you be aware that it was happening? I mean, only because I'm home. <laughs> okay, but if someone, where's your car? Is it in the room with you? No. No. Yeah, we you... have to sense it first. We need a sensory. Yeah, exactly. An alarm. We need, some, we need some type of receptor that is able to receive the information. Right? If I was sitting here blowing my heart's content on a dog whistle, how many people in this class would it change the behavior of? No one. No one, because you wouldn't be aware of it. So we need some type of receptor that is going to receive that information. Then as you guys pointed out, we then need some type of afferent pathway that is going to carry that information in. We need, oops, that's three. We need some type of integration. Well, actually, hold on. My disturbance shouldn't have been one. I messed that up. So disturbance is the problem. So we first need a receiver, receptor to receive that information. We then need an afferent pathway that is going to carry that information in. The third thing we need is that integration where we process the information and make sense of it. We know this occurs in the central nervous system. We know this occurs with our synapses. Once we make that decision, we then have to carry that information out in our efferent pathway. And that information is carried out to our fifth thing. And that fifth thing is our effector. And that effector oops, is what influences the change, fixes the balance, fixes the, or fixes the disturbance and brings the body back into balance, right? This isn't a new concept. This is something we have talked about before. At the very beginning of class, we've been talking about this ability to maintain homeostasis. So these five things are not new. These are things we have talked about before that are needed to maintain balance. As I mentioned, there's two important somatic spinal reflexes I will describe to you that you're gonna to need to know. And they're all gonna have this part, some type of a receptor, some type of sensory pathway, 
some type of integration processing, some type of motor pathway to some type of effector. All right. And so those are the five components, not new components, not new ideas. We're just going to talk about two specific examples. And they're the two that we've already been talking about. The stretch reflex is the one when the doctor hits you in the knee. The flexor or withdrawal reflex is the one when you touch something hot and pull it away. So these are the two examples that we've been talking about the most. And now we'll actually identify and describe the neural pathways that allow them to work. All right. Now, before we do that, we'll go ahead and take our second break. I've been talking for a while now, so let's go ahead and take our break. It is uh, 2.40 right now, so we will restart at 2.55. At 2.55, I will start the recording again, and we will describe these two reflexes. Once we are comfortable with that, we are done with our central nervous system, and we will move on to our autonomic nervous system. All right, questions on that? All righty, I will see you in 15 minutes. All righty. First, we are gonna talk about our stretch reflex. As we know, it is somatic, it is spinal, meaning that it involves uh, spinal nerves, meaning that it controls uh, uh, skeletal muscle, absolutely, but it is also ipsilateral, which means it is occurring on the same side, and it is also monosynaptic. meaning that it involves just two neurons and just one synapse. So let's go ahead and draw this out. Obviously, you're not going to be drawing this on the exam, but I find it useful for helping us to appreciate and understand uh, what we are looking at. So here is our spinal cord. Uh, and we will actually not I'm going to cheat. We just need to know what's going on in half of it. So we'll just look at half of it. Uh, we know there's our central canal. There we go. A little big. Dorsal root. Ventral root. Spinal nerve. Excellent. So we have all this, and I guess we should <laughs> label these things too to make sure we know what we are looking at. So this, of course, is our spinal nerve. Uh, this, of course, is our ventral root. This is, of course, our dorsal root. And this is our dorsal root ganglion. Excellent. Now, our stretch reflex, uh, we need to also talk about why it is important. Is it's important for maintaining balance. Oops, that's spell it right. This is the one that, as we mentioned, occurs when the doctor hits our knee with a hammer. The reason this works is because we have a muscle group on the anterior compartment of our femur. What is that big, oh, that's fine. What is that big muscle group located on the anterior compartment of our femur? Quadriceps. Say again? Quadriceps. Yeah, quadriceps femoris. 
Absolutely. We have that quad for Morris that we have up there. And as we know, it has an entire insertion pathway. And that insertion pathway involves the quadricep tendon into the patella and the patella into the, so there's my patella, into the tibial tuberosity of the tibia. Now, inside of our, let me use that. Here, inside of the quadricep femoris muscles is a special type of receptor called a muscle spindle, right? Part one is we have to have some type of receptor. And this receptor, it's going to be too big, is what we call a muscle spindle. This muscle spindle is this kind of curly Q type of looking sensory structure that is able to measure the stretch of the muscle. Knowing how long our muscles are, are very, very important. It allows me to stand upright. Notice if I'm standing upright and I slowly start to lean to the right, the muscles on the right side of my abdomen are gonna to start to stretch out. And when those stretch out, I know I need to contract them and that will bring me back into balance. Of course, if I go too far that way, this side is going to stretch out. And so I'll need to contract that muscle to bring me back. And so while I'm standing here appearing not to move, there's all these minor changes in tension, minor changes in length of these muscles that keep me standing upright. And as we've talked about before, we take this incredibly for granted until you've had far too many Jägermeisters. You've had too many Jägermeisters, then suddenly your ability to be able to maintain that balance isn't quite so good anymore, All right? Well, what the doctor is doing when he takes that hammer and hits you in the knee, he doesn't actually hit you in the knee. Where he actually hits you is in that patellar ligament. When he hits that patellar ligament, it causes the ligament to stretch. And that causes a massive rapid stretch of the, of the spindle. And the spindle incorrectly thinks your quadricep femoris muscle is getting really, really long. Oh my gosh, you're falling backwards. So what does it do? It thinks it's rapidly uh, expanding, so it rapidly contracts. And when it rapidly contracts, you extend your knee. So this is important for maintaining our balance and this is how it works. First thing is that muscle spindle, that stretch receptor that changes its firing rate based on how much it is being stretched out. Now, we know that's the first component we need. We also know the second component that we need is some type of sensory or uh, we could refer to it as afferent pathway. Now, what kind of neurons structurally are most of our sensory neurons again? Multipolar. Are the sensory multipolar? Unipolar. Which one? Unipolar. Unipolar, excellent. And when we have these unipolar sensory neurons, where are their cell bodies located? In the posterior gray horn? Not in the posterior gray horn. Where did we The find dorsal root ganglion. There you go. So obviously the cell body of this unipolar neuron is going to be here in the dorsal root ganglion. You are correct what you said before in that you're right, that information has to be brought into our posterior or dorsal root. So that is definitely where the information needs to come in, but its cell body is out the dorsal root ganglion. And so what that means is the axon from it receives that information from the muscle spindle brings it back to the spinal nerve into the dorsal root and brings it into the gray matter of our central nervous system where our integration is going to take place. Part three, integration. 
All right. Now remember, integration is where we process information. As we know, we process information by counting postsynaptic potentials. Right? Or essentially, processing occurs in the synapses or at the synapses. Let's say it that way. And with this particular reflex, how many synapses do we have? One. One. So that means that this sensory neuron has to, uh, has to synapse on my motor neuron. So let's use, I haven't used purple yet, our fourth component the motor or efferent pathway. Excellent. What is the structural classification of this neuron? Multipolar. And a multipolar somatic, I guess we should be more specific, somatic motor, where is its cell body located? Uh, anterior gray. Okay. Excellent. So here in the anterior gray horn, we are going to have its cell body. As you guys mentioned, it is multipolar, so it's going to have its dendrites. And so what happens is this sensory neuron comes and synapses right to the motor neuron, where it then processes that information. And it does that by being excitatory, meaning that when it stimulates this motor neuron, this motor neuron is going to fire. Now, this somatic motor neuron is efferent, it comes out, oops. The ventral root to the spinal nerve, and it needs to go to our effector. And in this case, the effector is the exact same muscle where the stimulus was. After all, it was this muscle group, the quadricep femoris that stretched, so it's the quadricep femoris that has to contract. So in this case, the effector is the same muscle or muscle group that received the stimulus. And so that multipolar neuron is gonna come and synapse on our muscle and of course, we know we want that muscle to contract. So of course, this is going to be excitatory. So we started with a stretch of the muscle. That produced a signal that went into our spinal cord communicated with a single synapse in a single location between just two neurons and was excitatory in nature, causing it to fire an action potential, causing the muscle to contract and our leg kicks out. Those are, oops, I forgot to put numbers to these things. This is of course number two and this is of course number five. There are our five components, our disturbance, the stretch of the patellar ligament, and that caused the muscle to stretch, that produced action potentials,
those action potentials stimulated our motor neuron, which produces action potentials and causes our muscle to contract. Yes, Laura, you had a question. Um, yes, um, I'm a little bit confused. So excitatory and inhibitory. In inhibitory doesn't necessarily mean it won't um, make an action potential or is it just a likelihood that it won't? You are correct. Technically the terms excitatory and inhibitory mean that it makes it more likely to fire an action potential or less likely to fire an action potential. Absolutely. Thank you. And in this case, when it's excitatory, we want this signal. So as I said, we want this signal to be enough to be able to stimulate the muscle to contract. But remember, as we talked about, if at the same time that the doctor was hitting you in the knee with a hammer, if you saw that there was a big metal spike in front of your foot, you would have information from your brain that was coming down your spinal cord saying, hey, there is a big, huge spike in front of my leg and you would be sending this inhibitory signal that would say, hey, don't kick out my leg. You're gonna hurt yourself if you do that. So notice we could change it if we needed to. So if nothing else happened, Yes, your leg would kick out, but if there was some other stimulus or some other motivation or some other thing that you saw, you would have the ability to modify this. If you don't really don't want to kick your leg out and he hits you in the knee with a hammer, you're not going to kick your knee out, right? One of the first thing the doctor does is he makes your legs dangle. He tries to get you to loosen your legs so that there's no muscle tone in it so that he can get the effect. If you're sitting there all nervous or tight, or if your legs are planted on the ground, it doesn't matter how hard he's going to hit it, your leg's not going to kick out. So yes, in, for just the simplicity of this, absolutely, it should be big enough to cause it to move, but we absolutely have the ability to modify it if we want to. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Excellent. No, it's a great question. I appreciate that. Excellent. But for, because well, I, I will save this image. So I'm going to go ahead and erase that inhibitory so it's not confusing. Yes, another question. Yeah. So is the fifth and final step just, is it homeostasis or, or what is it? Yes, because in normal, in normal conditions, see, we're tricking it here. Normally what happens is I, and again, instead of leaning back, which is what would be happening here, as I talked about, if I'm trying to stand upright, if I'm trying to maintain my balance and I start to lean to the side and my muscles stretch out, right? My muscle stretching out is the disturbance. The, the muscle spindle in that muscle signals to my spinal cord, hey, he's starting to fall over to the side. And my spinal cord sends a signal to the muscle telling the muscle to contract to bring me back into balance so that I don't fall over. So have I reestablished homeostasis? Absolutely. I've maintained my balance. And that's what this is about. This is about maintaining balance. All right? That's what this one does. All right. Questions on this. This is the easy one. If this one doesn't make sense, it's just going to get a whole lot worse. Yeah, another question. Yes, go ahead. Um, how does it, can you explain again how it processes information? Yeah, I guess so to it. what's happening is that when this muscle spindle stretches, what happens is it starts to produce a large amount of action potentials. All right, it starts firing action potentials. And those action potentials travel along our axon into our spinal cord. When it fires action potentials, we know that this is going to release neurotransmitter, right? Because that's what neurons do when they produce action potentials. They open up voltage-gated calcium channels. They release a neurotransmitter to the target cell. So this little bit of neurotransmitter is gonna be released here. That neurotransmitter is then gonna do something to this cell. When it binds to this cell, it is going to, in this case, it opens sodium channels. 
when that sodium comes into the cell, the cell depolarizes. And if that depolarization is big enough, when it reaches the axon hillock, it is going to produce an action potential. That action potential then spreads down the motor neuron to here, where we again release neurotransmitter. And in this case, we know the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine because we know that's what's released here. We know that acetylcholine is excitatory. It is going to depolarize the cell. And it's going to fire an action potential. And when it fires an action potential, we know the muscle contracts. So we have a stimulus, a stretch of the muscle, and that stretch of the muscle causes the muscle to contract. Did that help? Yeah. OK, excellent. All right. Any other questions on this one? All right, then let's save this one and then clear the board and do our second one. The second one is our withdrawal reflex. Or what is also known as the flexor reflex. Because if you remember, as we talked about, a flex is a protective uh, type of action. Remember, we talked about if you flexed all of your muscles, you'd curl up in the fetal position. So this is a protective reflex to protect the body. John, spelling is really bad today. Now, this one, as we know, is also spinal. It is also somatic. However, oh, and let's go. It's also it's spinal, it's somatic. It's also ipsilateral because we'll do it in the hand. But this one is polysynaptic, meaning that it is going to use multiple neurons with multiple synapses. All right. Let's again draw our spinal cord. Let's do it in black. And cheat, move half of it off the board so that I can central canal, posterior root, lateral root, anterior root. Excellent. Oh, gray horn, sorry. Dorsal root, ventral root, spinal nerve. And let's label all these things again. Excellent. All righty. So let's think about this one a little bit more. Our job here is to protect us. So here is, of course, as you can tell by my amazing drawing skills, your hand. And that hand, you happen to jam your thumb on a tack. So our disturbance here is, of course, pain. Right? Damage from that tack that we jab our finger with. Of course, the first thing we are going to need 
is some type of pain receptor. So thing one, receptor. And does anybody remember what type of sensory receptor of our skin perceived pain? I remember that it was uh, mechanical receptors. You're right. It is a mechanical receptor. And in particular, it was just those free nerve endings. Remember, free nerve endings gave us tickle, gave us itch, gave us temperature, and gave us pain. So we have these free nerve endings of our nerve where we are receiving that pain's information. And then, of course, this sensory neuron is going to carry this information in. Oops, let's take this. Let go ahead and change the colors again. Uh, we'll do orange this time. So two is our sensory afferent pathway. Uh, and of course, as we know, oops. What is the function, oh, pardon me, what is the structural classification of a sensory neuron? Unipolar. Excellent. And even though I can't spell it, you guys got it right. And where is its cell body located? In the dorsal root ganglion. Excellent. So we have that. So we know there's going to be a sensory neuron. Oops. A sensory neuron that is going to carry this information in through our spinal nerve, through our dorsal root into our uh, posterior root ganglion. And its cell body is off here to the side in our dorsal root ganglion. Excellent. But here's where things get a little tricky. I'm gonna switch things up on us here. Let's talk about our effectors. What do we want our effectors, and notice the key word here is I've used a plural. What do we want our effectors to be? If you touch something hot or sharp, what do you wanna do? Retract from it. Yeah, you want to bring it away. So if I touch that in my hand, what's a good thing to use to withdraw my arm? Our muscles. Yeah, which one? What do we want to flex? Our elbow. We want to flex our elbow. Give me a muscle that flexes the elbow. Biceps brachii. Absolutely. The, the bice, uh, again, flexor of the elbow is the bicep brachii. So flexor of the elbow is definitely something we want to contract to be able to move away. All right. So the absolutely one of our effectors that we're going to need is our flexor of the elbow. Now, if you remember before, when we were talking uh, in class, if you grab onto an electrified fence, if you grab an electric wire, why is that a bad thing? Your hand's gonna stay there because the electricity flexes your things, your muscles. Well, but if it causes my, my flexors to flex, wouldn't I pull away from it? it you can't because it keeps sending the action potential to clench not just to the flexor, but also to the extensor, right? You're right. If I'm touching that fence, both my flexors and my extensors are both excited and both contracting at the same time. And if that occurs, I can't pull away. So, so notice you... if I touch something hot or something sharp, I definitely want to stimulate my flexor to contract it, to move it away, but at the same time, my second effector is going to be the extensor 
of the elbow. And that one, I want to relax. Because if it's because it's if I don't relax it, I can't pull away. So notice in this case, I need not one, but two different effectors. I need the flexor of the elbow so that I'm able to pull away. And I need the extensor of the elbow so that I can relax it. I need to make sure my goal is to make the flexor excited and make my extensor inhibited. So I have two different effectors. And if I have two different effectors, I need two different uh, motor pathways. I need two different motor neurons. Pathways, plural. Now, these are still both somatic motor. So what is the structural classification of these neurons going to be? Multipolar. Multipolar. And where is the cell bodies going to be located? On the anterior root, gray horn. Gray horn, perfect. Perfect. So for the dark one, let's do a dark green motor neuron. There's my dark green motor neuron with its dendrites and its axon that is gonna come out the ventral root to the spinal nerve and go and communicate with my flexor. And I also need a second motor neuron with its dendrites, because it is also a somatic motor neuron, so it's also multipolar. And its axon is also out the ventral root. Its body is in the anterior gray horn. And this one goes to our extensor. All right. With me so far? Yep. Did, did we At, miss three or are we still getting to three? We haven't noticed we haven't done three yet. So we started, we, we know what the stimulus is. We know what the effect is that we want to have. And notice as we talked about our goal here to move away to our flexor, do we want it to contract or relax? Contract. contract. And our extensor, what is our goal? Contract or relax? Relax. So let's take this one step forward, one step further. If I want this flexor to contract, this motor neuron, do I want it to be firing actual potentials or not firing actual potentials? Firing actual potentials. And what about this one here, the, the extensor one, my goal, fire action potentials or not fire action potentials? Not fire. So we can take that back one step forward. This green motor neuron, do we want to excite it or do we want to inhibit it? Excite. excite. And our goal here to excite uh, for the extensor, is our goal to excite or inhibit? Inhibit. Excellent. So. Here's the problem. We have two neurons we need to communicate with, and we want them to do two different things, but only one neuron coming in. However, remember, we have three functional types of neurons, sensory neurons, motor neurons, and what was the third type of neuron? Interneuron interneurons. 
So remember here, and what color haven't I used yet? I haven't used a good red. Let's use a good red. Here in three, where we have our integration, this is going to involve both synapses and an interneuron. So let's see how we can make this work. We can start simple like we did with the stretch reflex. That sensory neuron can come down and synapse directly on our flexor motor neuron. So that when it fires action potentials, oops, it is going to excite my flexor motor neuron and my flexor will contract. Just that simply, we have accomplished half of our goal. But it turns out, remember, a single neuron can communicate with as many as 10,000 different other neurons. So this sensory neuron also communicates with an interneuron. Interneurons, what are the interneurons um, structural classification? Are they all multipolar? Yep. And its cell body is in the gray matter of the spinal cord. Uh, usually either in the posterior gray horn. I don't really have the room to put it in there. Uh, but that's where usually it'll be. So mine's a little messy in the way it's drawn, but it's here in the gray matter and that's the important thing. And our sensory motor neuron excites our interneuron and since it excites it our interneuron fires action potentials okay this interneuron then synapses on our extensor. And our interneuron, when it fires action potentials, it inhibits the extensor multipolar neuron. And when it inhibits it, does our extensor neuron fire action potentials or not fire action potentials? It does not fire action potentials. No action potentials. And so with no action potentials in our uh, extensor, no action potentials, this muscle is going to indeed relax. This muscle is going to indeed contract. And just that simply, we have pulled away from that painful stimulus. So notice the advantage of this interneuron is it let us basically switch the signal from being excitatory to being inhibitory. So one neuron, one muscle we could contract, one muscle we could relax. And by doing that at the same time, it allows us to pull away from that painful stimulus. Questions on that? Yes, Laura. Um, I have a kind of off topic question. The internet um, from on on Tuesday, um, when we were going over like the anatomy of it, um, it was, was it in the lateral gray horn or was that another neuron or was it just because there was no room? 
I'm sorry, can you ask that question again, what? Um, was the interneuron, is it found in the lateral gray horn or is it only found in no. the? So remember the lateral gray horn is where we find our uh, autonomic motor. So oh. this here is, so interneurons are either found uh, primarily in the, so our interneurons in here, we'll shade this red, are primarily found in the uh, posterior gray horn, but they can also in this middle region as well. This middle area that surrounds the central canal is also known as the gray ramus. Or gray, I'm sorry, gray commissure, gray commissure because it's gray matter that crosses the midline. So these are the areas where we find the interneurons primarily. This is autonomic motor, this is somatic motor. So these are where the interneurons are located. Okay. Yep. All right. I have done a decent job of drawing these. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that before I save the image but your book's got some very nice pictures that show these as well. So let's take a look at those. Notice here is that stretch reflex we were just talking about. Notice again, we have our stimulus. He hits that patellar ligament, causing the rapid stretch of the leg. That is perceived by that muscle spindle that sensory receptor, that there's our sensory neuron whose cell body is located in the dorsal gray, uh, in the dorsal root ganglion, carries the information in where it synapses on our multipolar motor neuron located in the anterior gray horn, which sends the signal back to the exact same muscle where the stimulus was, causing our muscle to contract, causing our leg to kick out, All right? So this is a monosynaptic reflex that only uses two neurons. Here, as we saw, is that pain reflex we just talked about. We have our free nerve endings, feeling the pain as we touch that hot pan. Our unipolar sensory neuron, carries the information in to the posterior gray horn, where we'll notice here they've got an interneuron that is communicating with multiples, but really this comes straight and communicates there. This one then comes to an interneuron that communicates there and there. And then the advantage of this is we get excitatory with one, inhibitory with other. So one muscle contracts, one muscle relaxes, and we pull away. And notice they also send information to our brain. This is when you curse. When that signal gets to the brain and goes, hey, I touched something hot, ouch. All right, after the fact. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So those are two reflexes you're responsible for. And of course the components, but you already knew the components of that as well. How are we on time? We're doing okay. Okay, the last thing we need to talk about. So let's go ahead and get rid of this. And let's see how deep I wanna get into this for now. Let's do that. While this is still fresh in our mind, Let's do that, because then how many days do we have left? We have two days left. Yeah, we can make that work. All right, excellent. The last thing I'm going to do for today is I'm going to just get our introduction to the autonomic nervous system. So let's just do a brief introduction to our autonomic nervous system. Uh, get the basics of it so that uh, tomorrow, not tomorrow, but obviously on Tuesday next week, we can really hit the ground running. All right, let's start first with some definitions. As we know with our autonomic nervous system, it regulates the activity of what effectors? What are the effectors that are gonna be controlled by the autonomic nervous system? Cardiac, smooth muscle, uh, one more. 
glands. Lose muscle. What else? Glands. Glands. Cardiac. Gonna... There you go. Excellent. So our smooth muscle, our cardiac muscle, and our glands, those are the things that are controlled by it. And again, it's that involuntary control. You don't have that cheeseburger for breakfast and then have to tell your stomach voluntarily, all right, start churning now as a result of it. And as we've talked about, the primary function of these autonomic reflexes is to maintain homeostasis. Your stomach stretches because there's a cheeseburger in it. It needs to contract more uh, to be able to break it down, right? You're not getting enough blood to your toes. Your heart has to beat stronger and faster to be able to meet the needs. So we want to maintain homeostasis of that, maintain balance, maintain the health of our body. Now, when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, primarily we are talking about the motor output of it. The reason for that is if you think about it, all types of sensory information can affect the influence of our cardiac muscle, our smooth muscle, and our glands. As we've talked about, if you see that bear with an ax, can that make your heart beat faster? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But as we also talked about, if you're carrying five bags of groceries up three flights of stairs, the increased oxygen uh, demand of the body, the drop in oxygen in your blood could make your heart beat faster and beat stronger. All right. Or change in body temperature, right, can make your heart beat faster. So all of our sensory information, internal receptors, somatic receptors like pain, temperature, right? And also special receptors like smell or hearing or vision. All of these things have the ability to modify our autonomic system. So we get information from everywhere and then it goes out our autonomic nervous system. Now, of course, it has to be controlled not by the cerebrum, but primarily by the brain stem mostly the medulla oblongata and the hypothalamus. Remember, we talked about how those are two major control regions. And again, they're outside of our conscious control. This is something that is done involuntarily. Now, the good news is because this is a motor system, we understand how motor systems work because we have already familiarized ourselves with the somatic motor nervous system. So because we've already uh, learned the somatic motor, we can compare what we've already learned in the somatic motor to the autonomic motor. When we do that, there are gonna be some obvious differences, the effectors, but there's also gonna be some differences in the pathways, and also some differences in the neurotransmitters and the effects of those neurotransmitters. So let's take a look at this. Let's go to our whiteboard and let's draw some stuff we know. I think I saved that. I'll save it again just in case. There we go. All right, let's start first with the somatic motor. Oops. The somatic motor nervous system. We, of course, know that this is going to begin. that big, I want to come here. We know it begins in the spinal cord. So if we draw ourselves a spinal cord here,
Excellent. Where in our spinal cord does our somatic motor nervous system begin? When we're talking about our somatic neuron, motor neuron, what was its struct, which again, of course, is its function. What is its structural classification again? Unipolar. Unipolar for a somatic motor? Multi. Multipolar. Excellent. Where is its cell body located? There you go, Amanda jumped ahead, knew what I was gonna ask. Anterior gray horn, excellent. And as it turns out, it's axon. Do you think it is myelinated or unmyelinated based on how we've talked about most axons? Myelinated. Myelinated. Excellent. So let's go ahead and draw that. We have a multipolar neuron whose cell body is located here in the anterior gray horn. Now it's multipolar, it's in the anterior gray horn. Of course, its axon comes out the ventral root to the spinal nerve. And as we just finished mentioning, I'll do that. It's myelinated. So let's put some myelin on it. Good enough. Excellent. We know something else about this somatic motor neuron as well, right? At the end point, what is the effector that it communicates with? Skeletal muscle. Excellent. So we know down here, we've got some skeletal muscle with its stripes on it and it's multiple nuclei and all those kind of fun things. And we know what neurotransmitter does it release? Acetylcholine. And what is the effect of that acetylcholine? excitatory or inhibitory? Excitatory. Excellent. So let's cheat. Bring this here. Give it a synaptic M bulb. Get it to release some acetylcholine, which is going to excite that. There you go. Absolutely positively no new information here on the board. All right. All of that is stuff we already knew. We've already talked about. We're already comfortable with. All right. Hopefully, questions on that? Excellent, that's what I'd like to see. So let's compare this now to our autonomic motor. And again, we really don't have to put motor here uh, because autonomic is motor, but let's go ahead and put it just for consistency sake. This also begins in the spinal cord. So we can conveniently draw yet another spinal cord. With a posterior root and a lateral root and an anterior gray horn, sorry, gray horns. Anterior gray horn, lateral gray horn, posterior gray horn, posterior median sulcus, anterior median fissure. Excellent. However, when we are dealing with this autonomic motor neuron, 
which of course is its functional classification. What is its structural classification? Multiple. Yep. All right. It is multipolar. But where is its cell body located? Also. Lateral gray horn. Excellent, right? In this case, remember our autonomic is found in the lateral gray horn. Turns out its axon is also myelinated. But there's one very important piece of information about this neuron. It does not go all the way to the effectors. So really, I'm calling this autonomic motor neuron, but it's really autonomic motor neuron number one. So autonomic motor neuron number one Starts here, nope. Starts here as a multipolar neuron. With its dendrites and its axon. And of course a motor neuron, it's gonna go out the ventral root to the spinal nerve and come this way. And again, as we also just mentioned, it is my myelinated, so I will myelinate it. but this one doesn't go all the way to the infector. Instead, this one goes from, whoops, don't want this to be capitalized anymore. From the central nervous system. And then it synapses on autonomic motor neuron number two. So somewhere out here in the body, there have to be a cluster of autonomic motor neuron number two cell bodies. And someone remind me again, what we would call a cluster of cell bodies somewhere out in the central nervous system, exactly. What we have here is a structure that is an autonomic ganglion. So basically this first neuron goes from the central nervous system to the ganglion. And because it goes from the central nervous system to the ganglion, they give it a special name. They call it the preganglionic neuron. Now, our second autonomic neuron is going to go from the ganglion to the effectors. Oops, that doesn't need to be in capitals. And based on that, guess what the name of this second neuron is? Post. Post it is the post ganglionic neuron. Absolutely. This neuron is autonomic neuron number two. Whoops. of course, is its functional classification. Let's go ahead and make this black so it stands out a little bit more. Its cell body, of course, is in the autonomic ganglion. Oops. 
And there's something else that's different about it as well. Its axon is unmyelinated. And it does go to the effector. So here we have our multipolar neuron. whose axon is going to go to the effectors. And again, someone remind me what the possible effectors that could be here are? Glands, smooth cardiac, muscle. smooth muscle. Excellent, glands, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. Excellent. So we only require two more pieces of information, the synapsis. Our first preganglionic neuron comes, and like we said, synapses on the postganglionic neuron. And this preganglionic neuron always releases acetylcholine. and it is always excitatory. So it releases our acetylcholine and it is always excitatory. Our Post-ganglionic neuron is going to come to its effectors, the smooth muscle, the cardiac uh, muscle, and the glands. And as it turns out, some um, uh, post-ganglionic neurons also release acetylcholine, but some release a neurotransmitter called norepinephrine, or what is also uh, called noradrenaline. Noradrenaline and adrenaline, norepinephrine and epinephrine are for the most part interchangeable for us as their functions. Their functions are pretty much identical but in this case, norepinephrine or noradrenaline is the name of the neurotransmitter that some releases. And remember, in our skeletal muscle, the effect was always excitatory. Does our autonomic nervous system always excite every organ that it talks to? No. No. So again, some of these are going to be excitatory, but also some of these connections will be inhibitory, right? For instance, when you are having that fight or flight response, or you have to stand up in front of the classroom and give a presentation, your hands may be cold and clammy because you're producing a lot of sweat. You're sweat glands are being excited. But what about your salivary glands? Are your salivary glands being excited when you have to give that speech? No, dry as a bone, absolutely. So these are being inhibited, these are being excited, right? Or different effectors, right? When I'm fight or flight response, I want my heart to beat faster. When I'm doing that rest and digest, I want my heart to beat slower. So the way we have these different effects, some excitatory, some inhibitory, is by using different uh, neurotransmitters, sometimes some acetylcholine and some norepinephrine. So notice our somatic motor pathway is a one neuron pathway. whereas our autonomic pathway is a two-neuron pathway. 
And again, I think I've done an okay job of drawing this on the board, but let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. There we go. So again, our somatic motor vectors or skeletal muscle gives us that voluntary control, always releases acetylcholine, it's always excitatory, and it is a one neuron pathway, right? We are starting with a multipolar neuron whose cell body is located in the anterior gray horn. Axon comes out the ventral root, spinal nerve, notice it's myelinated the whole way it releases acetylcholine and that acetylcholine is excitatory and causes a contraction. All right, this is the pathway we know. This is the pathway we already understood. But what we can compare it to is our autonomic. Again, different effectors, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, glands. Two different possible neurotransmitters. Some will release acetylcholine, some will release norepinephrine, and we'll actually talk about which do which. It's not like, you know, autonomic neuron one on Mondays releases acetylcholine and on Tuesdays it releases norepinephrine. Some of them release norepinephrine and other ones release acetylcholine. And we'll talk about and actually describe which ones are which. So we will talk about that. Remember with our stress response, especially when we are dealing with that stress, we can also release norepinephrine and epinephrine or adrenaline and noradrenaline into our blood, giving us that big global stress response. And on some organs, it's gonna be excitatory. On some organs, it's gonna be inhibitory. So we have a much more complicated relationship here, including that much more complicated pathway. We start with that preganglionic neuron whose cell body is located in the lateral gray horn. Its myelinated axon goes out the ventral root and travels to our autonomic ganglion where it releases acetylcholine and it is excitatory. There in our autonomic ganglion, we then have our postganglionic neuron. Oh, that's too much like the color we have our postganglionic neuron, its axon is unmyelinated. It goes to the smooth muscle, the cardiac muscle, the glands. It can release acetylcholine or norepinephrine, and it can be excitatory or inhibitory. So it may be excitatory on the cardiac muscle, but inhibitory on the gland or vice versa. So, we are dealing with, and I think I've got one more pretty picture that shows this. Excellent. This is that nice table from your textbook showing the same thing. A single neuron in the pathway for our autonomic nervous system, two neurons in the pathway of our autonomic, including the ability to release stuff in the blood that we'll talk about as well. But notice that this also hints to one more important piece of information. Notice there are going to be some differences between the two branches of the autonomic. And not just functionally, but anatomically, there are going to be differences between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches. All right. And that is where we will pick up on uh, Tuesday. We will talk about our two branches. And again, the last point I'll leave you with, because again, I want you thinking about and looking at this information. What is the cutesy little rhyme we have for the sympathetic nervous system? Fight or flight? Yep, fight or flight. Digest, go fight or flight. There you go, fight or flight for the sympathetic. And you're right, rest and digest. For the parasympathetic. So we'll see if those uh, cutesy little mnemonics are uh, accurate or not uh, when we come back on Tuesday. All right, excellent. Questions on any of that? Um, can I ask a question a little off topic? Certainly. 
So uh, it's more for uh, for that neuromuscular junction. Mm -hmm. So like 10 days ago, <laughs> I don't know why I decided to get a Botox on my chin. Okay. So yesterday I was looking at the mirror and okay, let me turn the video on. So I, I started scratching my chin and it just went up like this and stay, stayed like that for like 10 seconds. So I started panicking and was doing this and it went back to its normal shape. But what can cause that? Like, did I just spread that botulinum toxin or whatever? Like, why can it? It's, it's possible that could be the case. The, what, what also might have happened is because of the Botox, you might have a little less sensitivity there. So you may have, have scratched a little, maybe a little harder than normal. And what you can do, remember, if you think about what Botox does, Botox affects the release of neurotransmitters from the neuron. Yeah. It doesn't affect the muscle cell. The muscle cell is still able to contract. So if you're stimulating the muscle mechanically, or maybe you, uh, you, know, you somehow stimulated the release of neurotransmitter from the synaptic end bulb, it could cause uh, an uncontrolled contraction of the muscle. So what, it, and you might've just had a muscle twitch as a result of that, uh, a muscle contraction as a result of that. And again, because of the lack of sensation, it can, you know, it can feel weird. It can have a weird feel to that because of that. So, so my guess is that it might've had something to do with that. Is that probably you just, it was, it was an increase in muscle tone either from an irritation or something else that eventually calms down okay i thought my face is gonna stay like that <laughs> it started back. Well, I'm, I'm glad it doesn't look like it will yeah, thank you you're welcome all right excellent any other questions All right. Spectacular. Excellent. Well, then you guys have an excellent weekend. Study hard. You are running out of weekends to study for this exam. So uh, study hard for this. This is your last big lab and lecture exam. Uh, be successful. Work hard this weekend. And I will see you guys on Tuesday. Take care.